Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. The code ideology, the concept, doesn't knock sex between black people and white people per se. What it does is says, where are the priorities? What do you do first? Do you clean up the mess first? Do you go to work first and then play, or vice versa? But they're doing it backwards. See, like you're talking about some club. The way for black people and white people to come together, quote, unquote, is in some corporate room. With ev- yeah, with everybody ready to sign contracts and do business. All right? And no nonsense, no whiskey. See, no gin, no snort and coke. No running up and down hotel halls, I mean wiggling and giggling and, and slamming doors and, and sloshing uh, champagne all over the carpets. No, that's not the way. The way to come in is sober, business-like, and sit down and start talking about, now we're talking money, we're talking factories. See, we're not talking about a party. See, because we are party-oriented, and they know this. This is why the code says a party consists of what? One male, one female. If a third person shows up, you're supposed to be having a meeting. So, I mean, I read something that Frederick Douglass has on his uh, pillow over there in, in, in his house uh, in the Washington Post. It, what, it's an old saying, two's company, three is a crowd. Okay. Now, you can definitely apply that. See, because black people have this thing, we got to get together. Get together and do what? Have a party. See? That's all we can think about. And then when we go there, we don't know what we're supposed to do when we get there. That's why we do anything. Before the thing is over, it lasts long enough, somebody's going to get hurt. Because we don't know what to do. We don't even know how to have a party without it being destructive. So this thing about white people wanting to come together with black people in a nightclub, no. See, if Mr. Prince was in here himself, I would say, no, 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 wait a minute. You're a businessman, even though you're an entertainer. See, I'm quite sure when it comes to receipt time and all like that, Mr. Prince, see, he gets down to business back there in the cashier's office. You know, well, I mean, he's, I got my videos out here now. I mean, like, let's, let's talk business. It gets like the mafia back there, see. I mean, you know, where is the money? See, you know, and so it's the same way. Black people and white people interacting, as they said. No, no, black males interacting with white women. And, and black women having hang-ups about it. No, we shouldn't even be into that type of thing. Not a nightclub. We tell them, no, we do not meet white people at nightclubs. That's out. We meet white people in boardrooms, all right, where they are discussing great big money, huge contracts, skyscrapers going up. See, this is where we want black faces to be. Not out there, I mean, you know, with a whole lot of psychedelic lights and whatnot and the air, air all heavy with marijuana and whatnot. No. Yeah, this, this is what you think of us. No. Uh-uh. All of that, if ever, and hopefully if never, has to come way after. See? I'm sitting out there on the veranda looking at all my yachts out there on the ocean. See? Right? Now, you see, you might have a party. Well, maybe. Y'all go ahead and start. I'm thinking about bucks thinking about more money. In fact, I'm thinking about taking over this entire beach. See, you know. Right. That's the way we should, you know, that's what, you know, I'm just making it kind of comical, but that's the way it should be. 
and get in that mindset. No parties. Right down to the nuts and bolts type thing. Still on the same subject. Office parties. Black people don't go. Let them know. You're out. I don't care how many white people you work with. You've got something to do that day. Well, what, what do you have to do? Business. See, I have pressing business problems. Have to be taken care of immediately. Uh, can you excuse yourself from the party and help? Maybe you can give me some advice on how I can handle it, see? You know. Well, what kind of business are you in? None yet. That's the problem. <laughs> All right? Yeah, and that's the way you go at them. See, stick with the truth. Don't lie. See? Right. Well, tell them just like that. See, learn to think on your feet. See? Right. That's my problem. Mr. Fuller. Yes. Um, the, you, you right. talked earlier uh, at some point about, um, well, as you're talking now, about uh, being in the boardroom. All right? Being yes, Being at the head, making money, being on top. It seems awfully strange that when um, uh, we, as particularly black people, begin to do that, okay, all of a sudden things happen, all right? Things, uh, like the gentleman at Beatrice Foods, uh, uh, Reginald uh, Lewis. Okay, and you were saying how to handle away. it. That's the bottom now, line. Now, you know, I, I don't know what, how he died. I, they say he died of a brain tumor, whatever it is. But it seems awfully strange to me. Anytime um, a black person gets to any level, that level of money, power, he fades off the scene. Uh, NBC food was up for sale at some point, and, and, and all of a sudden, Bill Cosby knocked on the door and said, I want to buy it. All of a sudden, it wasn't for sale anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, How do you handle it? How do you deal with a you situation where you are there, you yeah. finally made it, yeah. and, and the these things still start happening. shutting in your The glass door. ceiling and all that. Okay, first thing you do is you remember you're in a war, and you're still a victim, and you're going to be a victim as long as this exists, until we erode it, knock it out, I hope, with a code in just a few years. Because through codification, I believe it can be done in a few years, if not less. Okay, all you usually use your corporate setting for, mostly, is to learn how they operate. Now, you make all the money you can while you're doing it, but mostly it's just a study. It's just an incubator for study. Don't look at it as anything else. Don't look at it like you are getting close now to the goal. You are finally going to make the dream. No. You've been ruled out right from the day that they let you in. See, that ceiling is there. You're never going to get there. But you use, you learn everything. See, now, people that we refer to as, the non-white people that we refer to as Japanese understand that. See, these people are producing cars and complicated electronics. But they know that there's a ceiling. See, they know that. They're not fooling themselves. They come around with their business suits and attache cases, and they sit down, and they talk big money, and they make big money. But they also know what white supremacy is, and they know that at any time they can be forced to eat those cars. Oh, yeah, the white supremacists can wake up tomorrow and say, your stock is down. What do you mean my stock is down? Because I said so. And you're not going to be able to trade here. You're not going to be able to do this. You're not going to be able to go here and go there because i got to deal with those people. I mean, i got to deal with the, you know, you're out. You know, Toyotas, Mitsubishi, you're out. Well, what am I going to do with all these vehicles i got sitting on the dock? Throw them in the ocean. Do what you can with them. You're not going to move them because there ain't nowhere to move them to because I own the earth, the entire planet. That's what white supremacy means. See, they know that. You hear black people going around saying, oh, the Japanese are buying up everything. Buying it from who? If I can sell you something, you better believe I got the muscle to take it back. All right? Anytime. They're not buying anything. They're renting. Just like you are. You don't own a house. Black people say they have a country. You don't have a country. Not under white supremacy. You got a flag. That doesn't make a country. You know, you look around, you don't see any white people around, so you say, we are independent. No such thing. Because when you get ready to move some products, that's when you find out the truth. They also tell you the value of your money. You print the money yourself. And you say, this is my money. But they come along and say, your money is only worth such and such today. 
And you say, but no, it doesn't. That's crazy. Of course, it was worth such and such a thing yesterday. And I say, you, you're talking about what you say. I'm telling you what I'm saying. You got all of this. It is now devalued. It's worth one-tenth what it was yesterday. Well, why do you say this? Because I'm me. And I'm big enough to do it. You're going to whip me? What you got to whip me? A bunch of ragtag people who are depending on me to show them how to do everything? I can burst that dam and flood this place, the dam that I built. So don't talk to me, boy, unless you know what you're doing. Now, you want a deal? Let's deal. And that's the way it is all over the world and has been as far back as I can remember. And that is the truth. If that's not the truth, then this is not real, this thing called white supremacy context of white supremacy gusty renegade in for another broadcast hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy today's date <clears throat> thursday november 23rd 2017 so i have been told uh, this is our weekly broadcast on neutralizing workplace racism uh, we do not take holidays I'm very aware uh, racists have declared uh, we are supposed to be, I guess, having our feet up, having chitlins, turkey, gravy, whatever it is. Uh, I think under conditions of white supremacy, we don't really have a lot to celebrate. Uh, we should be trying to use our time and energy in the most constructive manner possible. And most importantly, uh, I think we should be very aware with regards to time and energy, racist directly and indirectly, they dictate, tell white people all over the world how we should use our time and energy, what's valuable, what days are valuable, what we're supposed to be doing uh, on those days. I think that's one thing that works against racism, white supremacy right there, as opposed to for folks who are out getting ready to go do their shopping for what they call Black Friday and elbowing people down in the aisle to get this deal and to snag that item. Uh, that is all dictated by racist man, racist woman. I think uh, we can start looking at things and seeing what is valuable. What should we be doing with our time and energy if there is a war of white supremacy being waged against black people. I think we should always be looking for the best ways of investing our time and energy you use today to hang out with black people, non-white people that you care about. You all were able to spend constructive time. Great. Uh, but we have a lot of problems. Uh, our counter racist objectives should always be top priorities with regards to what we are doing. If we are allowed a little free time from the plantation. Number again for folks who would like to participate, 641-715-3640, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Number again, 641-715-3640. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. Announcement I wanted to make sure to get in as well. We've had massive interference, and that is the only way I can uh, classify it. I have no problem as a victim of racism if I messed up something or just being inept incompetent. I have no problem uh, confessing to that. If <clears throat> my own ineptitude causes problems with the broadcast, that is not what is the issue. There has been massive interference uh, with the archives. I was not even able to upload <clears throat> the broadcast from yesterday. Um, we had Mr. William Clark on the program. I uh, kept going to the site to add that uh, broadcast and it would not work. I tried yesterday repeatedly, tried today repeatedly, would not work. I couldn't even access the page. I could access all the other pages online, could not access that page. Uh, I'll try again today. I had that same problem last week, even though after a few days it abated and the feed was current uh, and even other people 
I think last week on the compensatory call in, we had a listener who uh, wrote in and said he was having difficulties accessing the content on iTunes. I had someone else who wrote and said that they checked multiple different sites, SoundCloud and other places, and they were having problems. It's not even the same audio feed. Uh, at different sites, like the audio feed at SoundCloud is totally different from the audio feed at iTunes. And they were having problems in both places, as have I. I even went to upload uh, the audio uh, from yesterday at SoundCloud and had problems there as well. So I can only conclude this is continuing because we've had so much uh, interference and difficulties uh, for years that we have been broadcasting that that's what it is. If you are having trouble, it seems that lots of people are. Uh, I'm going to stay diligent. Uh, I'll email tech support. You all can do that as well. Write to folks at tech support on any of these platforms. If it's SoundCloud, uh, Blueberry, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever you happen to listen at, <clears throat> drop them an email and let them know the nature of the problem that you're having. Uh, and just, you know, see if they can do something from their end uh, as a consumer. But uh, I that's what to expect in the system of white supremacy. Uh, if you are a black person and you are trying, stumbling, though you may be, to work against their system, you can expect massive interference. Continuing, uh, as always, I forgot to get it just because the strangeness of the day and what have you. But uh, if we do have folks who have worked out how to make sure you have no problems on your job. You get to take whatever days off when you want. You don't have any problems getting your vacation days. You don't have any problems getting your raises, promotions, getting a nice cushy office, no bickering. You don't get accused of things falsely or reprimanded for being too quiet. You should be one of the first folks to dial in and share with us specifics about how you did that so that others can replicate your quote unquote success. Certainly, if we have folks who are having difficulties, any trouble, feel free to write in. It is holiday season, so if folks have <clears throat> questions around that or looking for suggestions, great if you figured out tactics that work well for any aspect of what's going to be happening from now, probably through January, with the holiday parties, gift exchanges, any of that stuff that pops up on the job. If you have figured out some tactics that work well, minimizing anything that deals with that, great. We need that sort of information dialed in. I will repeat from yesterday, uh, we had Mr. William Clark on, former uh, firefighter down in Florida. That program was pretty much workplace racism a day early, uh, but he shared so many things one aspect that I knew I was going to repeat from today, man, with what he said yesterday and the things that were happening and, and sabotage and all of the hijinks that he was facing in his workplace, Mr. Clark, <clears throat> I would not under any circumstances eat anything on the job that goes for holidays. Anytime I would not eat anything. <laughs> and if, if you need why is that? You know, I'm cool with some of the people on the job. And, you know, if they want to make uh, a sweet potato pie or something cool and bring in a shit, go back and listen to the program from yesterday. That would be uh, first and foremost. And I'll just repeat beef briefly what I said then. Sometimes you don't even know the people that have vendettas against you in an office setting. Uh, it could be something petty. It could be that they're just racist and you're the black person that they want to mistreat for the day. It could be anything. Make that a standard part of your code and you can insert whatever it needs to be uh, that you have dietary concerns, food allergies, you've already eaten, picky eater, whatever it needs to be. But just make that a habit, a pattern. And really from day one, if it's something where you've already been doing this and now you're changing your behavior, no problem. Again, diet, food allergies, whatever it is, but I would not eat anything on the job over the next month or so. I know it's real popular for people to make cookies and cupcakes and that's nothing, nothing. <laughs> Just make sure that that's known. You can avoid some problems seen and unseen with that. Continuing. I also forgot if you do not want to dial in, you can email if you have commentary you want to share until justice at gmail.com until justice at gmail dot com and we can share your commentary on the air uh, we had one person uh, who wrote in uh, they were asking about Pam uh, I tried to ring her this morning I was not able to get through but I have been checking emailing writing in to see how she's doing hoping that she is feeling better uh, we will be hopefully getting her back on the broadcast soon uh, I have passed along I even told her this morning when I was leaving my message uh, the concerns and well wishes uh, from listeners uh, someone did write that on the page this morning 
Uh, now, from last week, we had <clears throat> a black female. She wrote a report uh, about abuse, mistreatment that she was experiencing on the job. Uh, she was specifically saying that she was working, uh, doing some of the catering uh, for weddings and different types of events and event staff having to work with whites, uh, sometimes white females. And she was talking about some of the problems she experienced. I think last week she <clears throat> mentioned specifically uh, there was an aroma of cannabis uh, at the event. And the whites started giggling and, and whispering between each other and kind of looking at her, uh, implying that it was her. And then they went and asked her about it. And then it turns out it was somebody else entirely uh, who confessed, admitted to everyone that, yes, they did have cannabis uh, on the on the site. It was theirs and apologized and what have you. She had uh, a extensive list in her email of different types of events that she has experienced. And I got stopped when we hit the one with the cannabis because there was a question attached to it. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I got the rest of what she uh, wrote in. Uh, so, okay, so this is the last few. I missed about the last three. Okay. My boss, again, black female, my boss was being unprofessional by talking to me about how a bride didn't have enough money to pay for certain things. The fact that she brought the situation up more than once was sus suspicious to me. Of course, the client was a non-white Hispanic, quote unquote, female. Uh, next event, I walked into or next issue, I walked into an event with my white male coworker almost right away. I identified myself as the bartender to the suspected racist coordinator. Within two minutes, she says, which one of you is the bartender again? A couple hours into the event, the coordinator's husband referred to me as Laquisha. It seems as though he just gave me a new name when he couldn't remember my name. My female coworker was there, but claims she didn't hear it. Later on, my two coworkers were t uh, taking wine from my bar and serving pouring glasses in the backyard where everyone was. <clears throat> I went outside for the bottles and also to tell them to not serve any more wine because I need people to come to the bar so I can get my tips. He says, people are tipping you? I left a plate of food outside and at the time I suspected he threw it away because when I asked him about it, he played dumb. A couple of weeks later, I see the same caterer, a Hispanic female who fixed my plate and she told me that my coworker willingly took my plate of food from her and said that he would save it for me. I'm going to stop there, even though she has other incidents, just to get into suggestions. First, the name thing. We've talked about that before. In my view, black self-respect. And as Mr. Clark said yesterday, don't let it hit the ground. That sort of thing, when they're mispronouncing your name or making up new names, nicknames, all of that, the first time should be the last time. Every single time where it's something other than your name, sir, ma'am, my name is... If you could please address me that way every time, I would appreciate it or, you know, whatever variation of that. But that should be called every single time with the food that came up yesterday uh, with Mr. Clark. He talked about it. I know certain uh, some people are in work environments where you're eating, maybe you're preparing food or you're eating or like with Mr. Clark, you're staying, you're actually sleeping on the workplace. So you're going to be there long enough that you're going to be having to eat meals and maybe even prepare meals with the folks that you're working with over the course of a day or two days. Those environments, you're going to need a whole different code about food. I would not, I would not have food sitting around where you're not able to pay attention to it, really, if, if it's not right in front of you. If you're on a job, you're with whites, and this might even just be across the board, even with non-white people. You have food and you leave, uh, like in this type of situation, the wedding event thing, the food is there, you leave, you're taking care of other people and what have you, I would toss it. Uh, if you can't consume everything right then, I would toss it. I would, Or I would eat, put small amounts on your plate or what have you. So you can just eat, you know, the one or two quick little things, toss it. And then when you have time to eat again, you get a little small amount and eat that because I just would not trust whites uh, to be correct and leave your food alone. We talked about that yesterday and I can even relate to my own work experience. This was a massive problem uh, in one job that I had food disappearing, people eating your food, tampering with it, just major 
major problem, one I would not want to bank on the kindness of any white folks that I work with ever in life. Back to her last few events. Next one, she says, Every now and then, I work at a wedding venue. The girlfriend of the owner of the venue gives me get out vibes. Uh, I think that's referencing. I actually have no idea what that means <laughs> unless she's, uh, you think she's some sort of predator out uh, looking to sexually sewer a black person. I guess maybe uh, like the movie. It's one microaggression after another. This woman seems like she is on Xanax or some form of antidepressant. She's loud, curses excessively, gets overly dramatic when she talks. Her main job seems to be feeding the baby goats and riding around on a golf cart with her dogs, picking up dog poop. The first time she attempted to have a conversation with me, I was getting... The first time she tried to have a conversation with me was as I am getting my cash from my boss and obviously on my way out. She asks, so, Ashley, where do you work? I pause because I don't want to tell her, and I'm suspicious when white people ask me this. They just want to know how much money I make. I tell her only the name of the company, not what I do there. And she looks at me, expecting me to continue. I say, yep, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, too, so I have to get home to my babies. I have three part-time jobs, however, still home most of my time. Over the next two minutes, I'm trying to cut her off so that I can excuse myself and leave, but out of the blue, she is sharing unpleasant details of her motherhood and deadbeat ex-husband. I guess she thought I could relate. I mentioned my husband needing to get to work and quickly exited stage left. I notice a pattern where whites, upon meeting a black person for the first time, will share one or more horrible experiences they've had in their lives almost immediately perhaps because they're assuming that pain or discomfort or misfortune is all we can relate to. I'm just speculating. The next day, she announced she was going on her boat. I had an idea where she was going, so I asked, and was I was correct. Based on her face, I don't think she liked that I knew where she was going. Then she says, I have to figure out which boat to take. As soon as my boss leaves the room, she walks away, but I yell at her, So, did we decide which boat we're going to take? She laughed, and I laughed even louder. Her boyfriend, the owner, is weird and racist. He was talking to my boss, and as soon as he saw me, he stopped everything and said, Who is that? I gave my name and a hard handshake, hoping maybe his mouth would close if I shook his hand hard enough. Later on, I asked my boss, Who is a a suspected racist, but self-proclaimed woke white woman if she noticed him stare at me and what was that about being woke and white i knew she would be ready to defend him she didn't let me down she says he has an erotic picture of a black woman in his house he absolutely loves and adores this black woman he's always asking about her I respond, sounds fetishy to me. Nodding, she laughed and said, maybe I believe she was being deceptive and practicing racism. Last one. She says a few times white people that I know don't know that a few white people that I know and don't know have come up to me, looked at a group of white people and then looked back at me while shaking their head say and saying white people man my question is are white people trying to remind me that i'm the only black person present and simultaneously acknowledging that white people are racist when they do this what is your interpretation uh that scenario i would probably have to see it to get a better gauge to see exactly what the white people are doing if i'm understanding it correctly a group of white people coming up to you a black person they look at another group of white people and then they look back at the white uh, at the black person and say white people man it would depend um i would yeah i would have to see exactly what the white people are doing uh to grasp what's happening in that exchange i think sometimes that sort of scenario if i'm grasping it i think the white people who say that Uh, kind of with the joke or what have you, (coughs) white people, man, I think it might be 
to try to suggest that there's something wrong or even racist about that other group of white people. But the ones who are making that comment, we are cool. Like we are acknowledging like, yeah, those white people are messed up, man. What are you going to do? Like we're cool. We get it. We understand. We we are even joking about this with you. That's what I've seen. And that's that's the effect. I don't know what the intent is. Like I said, it, it might vary depending on what the situation is and all that. But one of the effects that I've seen is that it can lower the suspicion of the non-white person. Uh, they'll think, oh, yeah, these white people, they're cool. They get it. They know how their folks get down. And, you know, they're even willing, they're even willing to speak truthfully about that to me, a black person. Could be, we'll probably have to see the situation to really uh, get a, an accurate sense. Other folks, if they have a sense, you can feel free to share. Uh, number again, 641-715-3640, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star six one if you would like to participate. I uh, hope folks were able to survive all of the festivities. If you participated in all that, uh, feel free to let folks know they can participate here. You can have your turkey or pie, whatever you have left over, and hear some suggestions or share some experiences with regards to workplace racism. Uh, folks who dialed in with a hand up, mine should be open. Good evening, Gus. Greetings, Thomas in New York. How are you, sir? Um, happy Anathema Day. Um, I wanted to uh, report on some workplace racism um, things that I've noticed. Um, but first, since my first job is counter racism, um, I looked up Thanksgiving, Gus, and I. Uh, Acronyms for thinks is criticism for and giving is taking. So um, this is um, criticism for taking day. I think we should all be criticizing white people for what they have taken from us. Um, I wanted to say I've noticed a trend at my workplace arriving first with the food. Um, they had the audacity to ask me for the second straight year I gave them the same answer both times. Had all this food laid out at the hospital in the break room, you know, hey, you know, everyone cooked. And, it, and I said, I don't eat hospital food. So, you know, this year, they, I guess, they, last year, they, they laughed and accepted that. But this year, they, well, we, we cooked this at our houses. I said, once the, it is the door of the hospital, it becomes hospital food. They all laugh. I didn't eat any of it. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that's the perfect workplace environment for saying something like that. But um, I'm sad I missed the show yesterday. I didn't even know uh, you had one on. I didn't check. I apologize. Um, I've noticed a trend at my job is I go and get on the elevator. I press the floor that I want to go to. And then people come on behind me, and they say what floor they want to go to. Like, it's my job to push their elevator buttons for them. And I just know that, that I mean, I, I, I just don't think that's proper elevator etiquette. You pick your own buttons. I'm not an elevator operator. That's a $40 an hour job. You know, they're not paying me anywhere near that. So I decided that I hit my button and I quickly, swiftly um, moved to the back of the elevator. But um, I've noticed a trend amongst white women in particular, whereas they almost try to position themselves to let you get on so they could run to the back and just yell out their button, you know. And um, so I headphone them. Um, now I, I make sure I put my headphones in my ears. I don't have to have the music on. But, uh, I, I mean, I'm just petty like that. You know, I don't like holding doors for them or start revolving doors for them. I just, I just feel like they need to do things on their own. So um, that that was my my workplace uh, racism for this week. I'm just um, trying to avoid pushing the buttons for the white people. Hilarious, right on. The food code outstanding, and that's what I mean. That's something that you that one sentence. I don't eat hospital food. Easy. That will work every time. 
It's not like they can get a fork and cram food uh, in your mouth. But just, hey, I don't eat hospital food. No thanks. Appreciate it, Sally. Thanks, John. I'm sure it's great. I don't eat hospital food. You just have your sentence prepared. And that way, anytime it pops up in any circumstances, whatever the item may be, cupcake, carrot, whatever, I don't eat hospital food. I have allergies real quick. Um, With the elevator thing, I think that's great as well. The headphones, I think a lot of people have have talked about strategic use of employing headphones in the workplace and then making sure that you move away from the button, not helping white people, not helping white people always uh, encourage that. I think I could even see that where it's just, yes, we will make the Nigra do all of the button pushing for us as we get on and off of the elevator. I totally agree. Resist pushing and and just move away with the headphones. Do your ignore piece. Uh, Did we have other folks who had a hand up Uh, or if you wanted to share your own situation, if you have some things that are working well for you in the workplace, that's great. If you have problems, that's great. And if we have folks who have uh, wanted to respond to the question about what the white people might be doing or suggesting when some of them come up to a black person and look at some other whites and go white people, man, uh, the written in commentary. Other folks who dialed in with a hand up folks spectating. The trip to fame must be working with the folks who dialed in. I will say that for any day, even the quote unquote holidays, the people when they dial in, particularly with the hand up and are just hanging out, spectating, spectating and people that are listening, even if you don't have a hand up. It's hard for me to believe, even on a holiday, that there are black people who no problems, no issues popping up for me on the job. I'm getting all my raises, all my promotions anytime I want a day off holiday, even if it's unplanned. No issue. I find that hard to believe. But if that is so great, invest in the cows or any other non-white people that are doing constructive work. Invest. I hope that that is uh, continues to hold up for you moving into 201, 2018. And if you're in that greater spot, then definitely you should have some strategies on how you were able to make that happen for yourself so that we can replicate that. I'm sure there's some non-white people who do not have such a cushy position who would love some pointers on improving their prospects on the job. Uh, the person that dialed in last four digits, uh, three, three, six, six. Did you have commentary? I did. Um, thank you for taking my call and, um, hello to you, just the host and to all the listeners and, um, other callers. Just want to say I called in, um, well, last night I listened in, but I didn't get a chance to hear the whole show. But, um, from some of the things that I did here, it was just a, a really good show. And there were just some other things that were just, I want to say astounding, but Hey, I remember, and, and, and a lot of stuff that I, I got from the show was um, when I listened to you at the end when you were giving your commentary on some of the things that gentleman had said. And I remember the, the one behavior, scrotumizing. And um, then I remember that you talked about that and what that involved and how I think some men were fired, but then they got their job back because basically the courts was like, ah, you know, like with white people, they were just plain, you know. And you know how, you know, they're just sitting on, on these men's heads with their scrotum and penises on their heads. Oh, it's just plain. And I remember then when Roz came in, he said about, he to me, he tied it in very well, scrotumizing with a lot of the stuff that's, you know, happening now in the media. You know, all these uh, allegations that's being thrown about, because that's pretty much what it is. But, but um, they're allegations, but still we know there's some behavior behind that. So it is something about, like you were saying, the stuff that's done because that was done at work. You know, firefighters, they do live together, you know, when they're on their shifts. And um, I think one time I, I can remember you talking to talking about somebody who I think was in the Navy and uh, which pretty much, you know, it's like workplace racism. And I think somebody he went to sleep and he wakes up and two or three white guys are around him with their penises out because they were getting ready to pee on him or something like that. So, um, you know, and then when you talk about <laughs> You talked about hot luck, you know, food at work. And actually, I'm working this, this temporary job now, and it's customer service. So, you know, customer service, because you're sitting on the phone, and, and they, so they do a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of games and stuff, a lot of potluck. I, I, they're having, like, a contest to, you know, who could 
decorate the best cubicle and stuff that I can. And I would sit there work one day looking at, they were just really into it, especially, you know, these white people just decorate the cubicle. And I was just thinking about, you know, I was just thinking about listening to your calls and some of the stuff you say, and you know how we go to work to work, but with white people, I remember one time, this was maybe a couple of years ago, Dr. Rafael, he said, white people live to work. He said, black people work to live, and it's two totally different things. And so I'm watching them getting all excited and they're, you know, got paper and they're decorating. And I was just thinking, I said, hey, you come to work and, you know, you, you want to be just say on the mirrors of what you do. And yet here you, you have to deal with these white people who is it's almost like just another social arena. So you need to decorate your desk. You know, you don't decorate your desk. You, you know, you, you're not a part of it. She said, because if you don't come out and drink with us, but you're not a part of us. And, and I was just sitting at work one day looking at that and I was, Thinking about you know what I can remember hearing on one of your calls, I kind of laughed, and actually I kind of I you know kind of shook it off and like shake it off too because you know I get on the phone and somebody say something to me and I you know things will come out that I want to come out, but um, it is just something you know in the workplace and, and I'll tell you this real quick story about myself. No, let me say this about potluck, <laughs> and I agree with you with potluck, and I'm, I'll be honest too with you. You know I, I am a woman of a certain age, I mean I am over sixty. And, you know, when we're younger, and like I said, because when you're younger, you don't know better the things that you do. You have jobs and people bring things. And I, I always tend to find myself that if we have problems, like, I was the type of just like, I'm not going to cook anything. So, hey, you know, I'll stop it. So I'll get a fruit tray, a cheese tray, or something like that. But, you know, you come in and you, you know, you eat your thing, nothing about it. But within the last, thanks to the cows, the context of white supremacy, within the last, this is 2017, I, I started listening to your show in 2012, I think, late 2012 or, or 2013. So it's been the last four or five years. And I can remember in 2015 working at another job, and, you know, you get around Christmas time, and like you said, people are bringing cookies and stuff, and you want to have all these things. And I know when football season starts, whether it's college or, or professional, which, you know, start around about the same time, and they get these football parties, and so you know they go in. And I, I can remember going into this room, and I'm looking at stuff like fruit trays that were bought from the store. And if I got to get something, let me get a little bit of that. Maybe a bag of potato chips. You know how they get these little small bags of potato chips that you can get. I'll get something like that. And I find myself, and I was telling a coworker of mine at that time, and I said, I'm just, I, said, I don't know what it is. I, said, I just find myself to be so finicky now. And I said, and I look at all this food especially food made at home by people, I said, I just look at it so suspicious, you know, and then that was two years ago. And now today when we know the things that we're seeing out here now, that people would do things, you know, I mean, you could have somebody who's on a job who says, you know, I just don't like dust in the grave. And yeah, we're going to have people say, hey, I'm going to make some cookies. I'm going to spike those cookies with x -Lax. Everybody's in the office eating this cookie and having problems because somebody was trying to get at this renegade. You know what I'm saying? saying and I'm just, and I, now I'm looking at stuff and I'm like, so with this job that I, I'm on now, and I think they're supposed to have like a potluck coming up December 3rd. And, and even as you talk about it, I'm sitting here and say, well, I think I'll just, you know, bring me something from home that day. And it's like, because one thing too, you can't eat if you don't bring anything. So that, that's it. I'm not going to bring anything. But let me tell you real quick this story and then, I, then I'm off. And I thank you for taking my call. Did you talk about the, the craziness of the workplace? About three weeks ago, well, let me see. At the end of the first week of October, I was working on another assignment, and my that and that assignment came to, to came to an end. First week of October, October the sixth, which was a Friday, was my last day. So I remember I kept saying, "I said, oh man, you know, I said this is really kind of missing the money. You know, I really hope it's for a smooth operate, a, a smooth um, transition." So on what is the Veterans Day, I think it was, which was that Monday. My my agency got me a job interview. So I, I go to this interview, which is now, you know, it's really sad that you have to interview a temp job. Go to this interview, interview with this white woman. And she's excited. Yeah, you know, I let my guard down. I'm excited, you know, going this real small office. I'm mean, just so excited because I'm going to be working. I get some money, you know. And so start a work too. And I just so excited. Hey, good morning, everybody. We all just said Wednesday, you know, we had office lunch together, you know, she treated us, 
you know, um, they was just posting, you know, party and sitting in the room, you know, laughing and talking about things. You know, Thursday was going okay, da 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 da. I come to work Friday morning. I walk in the door. I say good morning, everyone, and no one. You could have heard a rat tinkle on cotton, as they would say, or you know, you. I mean, you just could have heard the mouse that roared anywhere in the world. It was just that quiet. Nobody said anything. Now, I'm the only black female in this office. One, two, one, two, three, four. Four white women, two white guys. Then, like, on the other side of the office, there were some people, but, you know, they would do their thing. So they had nothing pretty much to do with the side that I was working on. And uh, one of the white females that sat behind me, she was not there that Friday. And then there was a white guy that sat on the side of her. He was not there. So, I mean, total 180-degree change in the workforce. That assignment was over with that day. You know, and it was, and then it was things that because I let my guard down, so I just if anybody listening, just a warning, you know, to keep your guard up. Things about the office then was Friday. I was thinking, like, I like it was a small office. You had a ladies' room, you had a men's room, you just had one toilet. I was just like, I don't like that, and I know how they can be with that. You know what I'm saying? It it was the strangest thing, and and then she tried to excuse me something about my cell phone. And I remember she said, well, you know, you can't, because the type of work that we were doing, there's a, you know, jobs where you could put on, you know, put earplugs in and listen to music. Well, I get my music through my cell phones. You know, YouTube, you have YouTube accounts. And she's like accusing me about my cell phone. I'm sure I said, my cell phone has nothing to do with it. So I was telling my agency, I said, whatever she said about the cell phone was a lie. I said, that's what, that's what, she, that's what she said, we can listen to music. That's how I got my cell phone. But that assignment was over with. It, it was just, I want to say it's the strangest thing, but it's just, I, I guess maybe it's, it's like, no, Tim, you let your guard down. And, you know, for the long as I, as I said, because I really even contemplated telling the story because I almost felt just embarrassed, you know, for myself. And I'm just like, Tim, you let your guard down. And you got caught up in these white people. I mean, it was a 180 degree change. And I remember I came to work Thursday. I wore my hair cut real short. And so it was kind of cool that morning. And I had this uh, scarf draped over my head. And when I walked through the door, the white guy looked at me so strange. And I said, I mean, just like he was startled. And I, you know, I said, good morning. And he spoke. He said, oh, I like your rap. I said, okay, thank you. And, you know, and I just went on my desk and sat down. And I really think that white guy thought I was a Muslim because the way I had it wrapped around my head. And I was getting ready to tell him. I looked at him and I was going to you know, I'm not a Muslim if you think that. But then I thought about it. I said, I don't owe you any explanations. What happened Friday morning? I do not know. But my assignment ended that day. And I, I was just like, not, and I just thought about the being the only black person to work around with these crazy, um, I won't say I take that word away, but just working with white people. And just the things that, that come up in their mind. And, you know, it's sad because why? You never know. You know, you, ne- you never know. So I just wanted to share that and also to just say thank you for uh, uh, the show that you had last night because oh, he, he said some other things, but. Uh, I want to comment. I'll probably comment on those things on Saturday for Pittsburgh Call. But he, um, I mean, he gave a lot of very good information. And um, I will say this one thing, and then I'm off. I do like what he said. Black people, we build up white people, and we put ourselves down. And he said, because we don't recognize our power. And I definitely agree with that. And anyway, thank you. I hope people get a message of that. Try, if you guys are guard around white people, try not to let it down. And, 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 and keep your guard up because I, I let mine down. I'm so excited to have an assignment. You have to get another, you know, get a paycheck. And I mean, this thing slipped so fast. My even my head was spinning. So anyway, thank you for taking my call. I'll mute myself. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you're back to being our caller in Ohio since Red has moved along west. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> That is, uh, I'm glad you shared, and I've said that for workplace racism for years. Uh, I totally understand. It is not always the most pleasant thing to talk about, uh, either when things don't work, you know, work out well, or even when we've been mistreated. You know, it's not even that you did anything incorrect, just whites being racist. That's doing what they do. Uh, birds chirp, dogs bark, white people practice racism. Uh, but it's still, I mean, it's it's just... 
it is totally unpleasant to talk about. Certainly, Mr. Clark, yesterday, if you think it is fun and wonderful to talk about the time the white people pissed on my pillow at work. Like, yes, that is wonderful to talk about. Makes me feel great every time I think about it. But that just underscores all of the above, in my view, underscores why this should be something that we are just as eager, just as excited to talk about as Area 8 uh, or any of the other topics uh, as it relates to racism, white supremacy, because this is critically important, in my opinion. Um, I feel like with with the situation that you had, I'm glad that you shared for multiple reasons, because the first one, I think I had talked about this before. And this, again, so many black people have this problem where on Monday. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Rhonda, it's so good to see you. We're glad you're working here. Oh, it's great. I'm going to go out to lunch and show you pictures of my children. Remember Tuesday. Hello? Am I here? Hello? <laughs> no greeting, nothing. no nothing. And it totally, I mean, if you are a black person, if you're a victim of racism, it can totally confuse you. It's like, what did I do? Did I rob the bank? Did I take money? I mean, what is going on? That is them practicing mm-hmm. racism. They love, and I mean love, to keep us off balance where you don't know what to expect am i is my desk over here now am i sitting over here did Mm -hmm. i who did i they love that just to have us in total confusion and chaos uh and then that's why i say too with the greetings it's not attached to them at all uh i think uh chantelle had said she was having the same thing white guy one day he would come in and hey how you doing and then the next day wouldn't part his lips act like she's not you don't even Mm -hmm. exist anymore and my Mm -hmm. code you speak it's not about them being rude. In fact, my code, these people are racist. Now, when I go in to work with these racists every day, I'm going to speak. It's not because I like them. I'm not even really concerned with whether they speak or not. This is just my code. Uh, and I've seen where a lot of black people on the job, they get in trouble for not speaking that sort of thing. So you don't want to be accused of being discourteous or rude, but you're also not thinking, oh, this racist that I'm speaking to, I hope that we have a five hour conversation or anything. They don't even have to speak. I give my greeting and keep rolling. That helps you to not be off balance, or at least that's my thinking with it. It doesn't matter. I'm not concerned if you speak and are all chuckles and have a compliment, whatever. You're still a racist. If you don't say a word, you're still a racist, whatever. And I'm still going to say morning, evening, whatever it is. And again, that's just workplace courtesy. We're in the same spot. We're together 40 hours a week or whatever it is. I know how to greet someone. That's just code for operating in the workplace for minimizing conflict with the phone aspect. It's been my experience that discretion, they can be real arbitrary, and especially for I think we talked about this with Thomas in New York, real arbitrary, especially if you're like a temporary employee. Oh, man, anything. Uh, I think she she used the broom handle incorrectly. So, yeah, we need to you know be done with anything, uh, any sort of regulation. So, again, it's not in my view. It's not that black people are doing anything incorrect. It's just white people practicing racism. And I think even I think Thomas could testify, as probably can some of our other listeners, when you are in a temporary situation, a lot of times they're just looking for a reason to get rid of you anyway. I think Thomas in New York was right. saying uh, that they would allow him to work the job. And, and I think he said some of his employees told him what they do. They have a code. We hire and exploit temp workers. If you work them longer than 90 days, you have to bring them on full time. So they would get them with the intent of working them for 89 days or 88 days. And, oh, yeah, we're going to bring you on full time. Oh, yeah. Getting you all set up. And then when it gets to day 88, oh, yeah, we're not going to need you anymore. Sorry about that. And and then they might even bring you back and just start the whole thing over again. That's just the plan. So, you know, I wouldn't take it personal. I, certainly the disruption and in income and all that totally understand that's part of the racism, white supremacy as well, to make sure that we are not financially stable, just to have lots of instability Mm -hmm. on all levels. But that's how they operate. You just try to do the best that we can to minimize uh, those sort of things and keeping our guard up. Uh, I guess that'll be if if other folks have any commentary, real important in my view, uh, in terms of just being prepared, any environment, even I think that's one of the chief things that white people do trying to get us to lower our guard, trying to get us so that we are not suspicious. I think most of us are not sufficiently suspicious anyway. And then they do everything they can to make sure that that remains low. And then 
we just get blindsided. So really, really encourage that. It doesn't matter how nice they are. It doesn't matter how pleasant they are. It doesn't matter how well-meaning they might seem. In my view, it behooves us. The more prepared you can be, just thinking I'm going in with a whole building full of racists and I'm going to operate accordingly all day long, every day. That can be very challenging, very difficult. But just having that in mind from the beginning, I think it can protect us often from uh, having unnecessary difficulties. Um, leave it there. For other folks, if they had any suggestions, commentary for what they heard from Red, in Ohio, uh, not Red in Ohio, sorry, <laughs> call, in, uh, call in Ohio or if you had your own situation. Just, this is still the person who has, I'll just say this real quick before somebody come on. And I, I listen to this show every week. I, I do. And then I can't tell you what my situation is about like three weeks. Because I remember the first half and I was going to say something like I said. So, so I just like felt so embarrassed about it. But now and I listen. So I'm going to keep my eyes out to open. I mean, if it's just one thing that I even see, I may not experience but see to be able to share. Because, you know, like somebody said, we spend a life a third of our life working, if you will, because it's supposed to be with like eight hours to work, you know, eight hours to sleep, and then eight hours to spo- at home, supposed to be, you know, that's the ideal, I guess, scenario, which we know for black people, that's never really been, because we've spent probably over half of our life working and being worked to death, you know, by these people. But I definitely agree, and I see, you know, because we should be talking about this more, because we all have to go to work. And, and we, you know, you've already said, uh, you know, having black businesses don't necessarily mean that we don't still have to deal with this stuff because I think, you know, the painful thing about it, we do have to realize there are black, white supremacists. And I know that's a whole other topic right there, but there are. So, you know, um, for something that we do a third to maybe a half of our life, it is stuff that we need to talk about and, and, and share because, that, I mean, that right there threw me for loop. And let me just say this. I do thank you for the thing because you are right. You know, you walk in the room, say your good morning, you keep on walking. If somebody speaks back, great. If they don't, they don't. You know, just keep going. And and these are some of the things we have to learn because actually you know this is, we're not being treated. We're not being taught that or, or, and our youth are not being taught that because our youth, we've always been taught what? Learn how to play the game. You know, because learn how to play the game. That gets us for that gets us promotion. Promotion means money, blah, 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 blah. And so I just wanted, just wanted to, to put that out there. And I will keep my eyes open and ears open to listen to things, that I, the even stories that I may hear from other Blacks and to, to be able to come and share because, um, you know, this, this is horrible. And like you said, because we're, we're walking literally into snake pits and not even realizing that. And with that, I'm going to meet my line. Thank you very much. For sure. Context of white supremacy. Uh, Number again, 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if, excuse me, press star 61 if you would like to participate. Uh, Was that Thomas in New York? Did you have a comment you were trying to get in? Yeah, um, um, I'm sorry to hear that from the previous call. I hate with those situations where everyone knows that you you, you you got fired and you walking into it and it's like you get those looks. And you're like, what's going on today? Is you know, I hate that. It's a bad feeling. Um, you know, I engaged and um, I'm a mix with an anti-blackness at the workplace and um, it kind of um. It went a little further than I thought it would. Um, I, I had a African brother start working with us, and um, you know he he was training. And um, either way, when um, one day somebody was asking, you know, what was his name? He has a hard name to pronounce, and I couldn't remember, so I, I said, "Mr. Mfufu," just a joke, you know, from the uh, Eddie Murphy, you know, war. So either way, everyone laughs. And then that sort of became amongst the 
the group of, you know, real black, you know, but, you know, the monster group of guys, you know, like, you know, we're, we're you know, either way, um, we, we have a meeting with the boss, and um, he was late for the meeting because he doesn't quite understand how to use the um, deeper system for some reason, and um, and she said, hey, someone know how to reach Mr. Infu? So I was like, well, I got all the way up to the, to the boss, and I was like, man, I really felt bad when it got that far because it was like, dad, you know, it was like a, a little one, and it, it, then it became anti black because she's not even black, you know what I'm saying? It was just, I just feel bad about that, you know what I'm saying? Um, I, I, um, so I, I just wanted to um, confess, these are confessions of a um, victim here. Uh, I'm, I'm confessing to um, victimizing a, another black person. Uh, however, I have noticed that um, the guy, uh, we, we're speaking to him, you know, I, I noticed this a lot about a, a lot of Africans, and I don't know if it's a workplace code or just a code they have, but they don't want to speak about um, where they come from. And when you do, when they do, you come to find out that they're really overqualified for the job they have, you know, it's like, wow, that's what you did. Like, you know, why are you not doing that here? And um, they get marginalized, I think, uh, when they come to this country. Um, they they might have, you know, been a nurse in their country, but here, you know, they're, they're the housekeeper. You know, it's, it's just sad. And I'm with my line thinking. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Thomas, in New York. Uh, again, as stated, not always the most pleasant thing with uh, workplace racism sharing, even times where we don't abide by our code uh, as best we would like. Uh, thank you kindly for sharing um, that anti-blackness. All of us, that's why I say that consistently, all of us, every single person, Gus T. Renegade, you can put my name at the top of the list, but we've all been uh, contaminated with anti-blackness in the system. And that's one thing we can all do in the workplace. Just say, hey, I'm going to make sure I am, you know, controlling my anti-blackness, minimizing my anti-blackness uh, to the best of my ability. <clears throat> I'm going to try to be courteous uh, with other black people um, I'm gonna try and make sure I'm calling the black people by their name. If I don't remember anybody's name in the workplace, I'm going to try and do my best to make sure I remember the black uh, employees, black coworkers names. Uh, just that, I think, works against uh, racism, white supremacy. And I, I even I think that I mean, the conditioning, I think, is so just <laughs> immense that that's what we have, like in terms of reflexes, that'll be something to go through like a uh that'll be something to go to like in that sort of spot oh what is the guy's name that we need to get what's his name again like that'll be the default thing elevator insult mr <laughs> talks about that all the time that'll be the default thing oh i can make you know a joke about this person it'll be a joke about a black person because that's what we've seen like I, I know that's what i've been exposed to i can speak for myself that's what i've seen uh the the time that i've been on the planet is saturated with that just saying something bad about a black person a joke at a black person's uh, expense, just that alone, that I'm going to make sure to the best that I can. I don't participate in any of that sort of thing. If other people are participating in it, I'm not going to join in. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I'm not uh, carrying out any anti-blackness uh, while I'm on the job. Um, I guess if it's if it's spread that far, uh, do you think it would be constructive, helpful to maybe say something uh, that, you know, hey, that that we should probably not be doing that in the workplace. Let's try and call him by his correct name. Well, you know, um, it would be, um, but I just, I, I started calling him by his correct name, and uh, I just hope that I, like, <laughs> I led by example, uh, we, we call him by his incorrect name, uh, you know, because it, it, it's not, it's not something that's done in front of him, you know. Um, but I just felt like, you know, when I heard the Dominican man, it just say it, it was just like, wow, I can't pronounce your name. <laughs> you know, I call her, I got a name for her too. But um, yeah. So, and another thing I do at the workplace, Gus, is man, like I treat all management like police, you know. So they all have police names. So everyone, you know. It comes five zero, you know, like you know, they're gonna try to put a case on somebody today. You know, it's like you know, we 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 all talk about it from that perspective, and I think that you know it keeps us working together, you know, keeping each other out of trouble. You know, something's happening, we all get the, the mass text, you know, they're walking around, you know, um, but 
Um, in this instance, I just think it, it was really done just tastefully, man. And I, I, I don't really know how to clean it up um, as far as management because I don't want to admit to be the person that started it because I could get in trouble if they really wanted to make a big deal out of it. But amongst the people that I speak to on a regular basis, I learned the guy's name and I started pronouncing it correctly amongst them. And uh, hopefully they pick up on it. Right on. Right on. It, I do think it would be correct just if you hear it, because I can understand not wanting to be penalized or for them to take some sort of punitive action on you, which certainly could be the case. Um, but I do think it would be constructive if, if you hear it, uh, since you're taking responsibility, perhaps starting this uh, in some small way uh, to just uh, his such and such. Is it, or you don't even have to do a correction. If they say, uh, Mr. Umfufu, you can just say, uh, do you mean such and such and such and such? Uh, however, his whatever his correct name is, uh, insert that there. And, oh yes, da, da da da. So that can stop being a joke. So that, that doesn't uh, continue. That might be constructive uh, to do. But yeah, something that hopefully all of us can work on in the workplace. Being uh, working, no anti-blackness in the workplace. I think Pam talked about that before as well. Where she was having, I think she said she worked in an environment with a lot of black people, uh, maybe even predominantly black people, and that was the main problem: anti-blackness in the workplace, uh, and how to get that minimized. And particularly for her, because I think she was saying it was like one white person. So this, the anti-blackness was becoming entertainment for the whites on the job. So yeah, that <laughs> make sure we're all doing everything we can to minimize that as best we can. Uh, other folks, they have a uh, hand up commentary they wanted to share. Uh, Lon should be open if you have a hand up. Can I be heard? Yes, sir, Mr. Steele. Awesome. Uh, this is uh, Ken Steele, and I'm calling in from uh, Long Beach, California this evening. And uh, just wanted to um, say that, uh, you know, I have attempted to um, uh, liberate myself from uh, the plantation and create, I guess, my own uh, way of uh, making money um, by myself or rather uh, with another uh, victim of racism. We, I guess, partnered together and uh, created a, um, an online store um, that just basically uh, sells products. And um, one of the things that we are needing uh in getting this started and getting this off the ground was, is uh, marketing. And when you're on Facebook, um, one of the things that Facebook will do is it'll track, you know, your online activity, and it could tell that you we were in this, uh, um, I guess, uh, website creation and e-commerce space and doing the relevant searches to put us in front of uh, certain advertisements. So. Uh, one company that was advertising using Facebook to um, connect to uh, people who needed marketing services uh, is a company called Haibu, and they're owned by Yellow Book. And this uh, company um, was advertising free uh, a month of free Facebook advertising uh, on them. Uh, uh, you know, to get started with their service. And I entered up my information, entered the information for my company. And uh, about uh, a day, uh, the next day, I got a call from an account manager uh, at this company, Haibu. And the account manager was going through, you know, everything. And uh, basically the long and the short of it was uh, they wanted to uh, charge me for six months of service uh, at uh, – at five hundred dollars a month, and uh, they wouldn't charge me for the the six months. So uh, I I could either just opt to pay the lump sum there, or uh, start on a monthly payment plan. And of course, you know um, I I never tested their services. I didn't know exactly what they were doing, and you know I wanted to find out. And plus, they enticed me with uh, the opportunity to get their services for free. So I just pushed to them, look, how about we um, do a, a, a one-month trial if you guys say who you, if you guys have the results and the conversions that you guys say that you uh, do, um, you know, the service should pay for itself and then some. So, you know, even if we don't, uh, if we don't make 
uh, if you don't generate the amount in sales to cover up the bill, even if it's a modest amount, uh, we will definitely go forward uh, with the plan and, and go ahead and, uh, and sign. So uh, they, the, the account manager, I, I'm assuming, is trained to go for uh, the lump sum uh, immediately, and, uh, and he wasn't uh, having uh, my proposal of a free trial. And um, I've done account managing work for uh, digital services firms, and uh, you know I've sold software as a service packages. I've 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 sold digital services, so I know that you know there's always flexibility on their end, uh, on the end of an account manager. But there's always so much. But if you get their manager on the line, you can definitely get a better deal, and things can work out. So. Um, using some of this background, I was able to um, get the manager on the line, see if we could get a deal, and we were in talks, you know, for about a month. There was a, a month of back and forth about, you know, how we would go forward with this, and finally, you know, I I made a deal with them uh, that it would be, uh, you know, a net thirty bill. That is, you know, we would be billed thirty days after, um, you know, services are rendered. And then um, uh, 30 days after the start of uh, services, that would be our, our first bill. And they assured us that we wouldn't get a bill uh, for two months. So I was, you know, pretty excited about that. Two months credit with this company. Um, and they, uh, and, you know, we made the deal and everything sounded good. We had, and they, it's something that made very, um, that made me pretty nervous was they had a, a portion of the conversation that they said, okay, this portion of the conversation will be recorded and will be serving as you signing, uh, you know, up for this service. So basically after a month of uh, negotiation, we had a deal. And then when they said this whole portion of, you know, what the deal would be, I suspect that they were throwing in a whole bunch of information at me that, uh, was very different from what we agreed to. And, uh, you know, me and my partner, we, we agreed to the terms or whatever, and the service started. Lo and behold, the service was garbage. Um, they, they did not deliver on anything that they had promised. The projections that they gave us were not even close to what was uh, happening. And uh, I expressed, you know, my, my concern with this about two weeks into the service. And then in the third week, I said, you know, maybe we're, we're going to cancel because this is not improving. And uh, suddenly, I'm hit with a $300 bill at some sort of prorated amount. And, you know, I get my account manager on the line, and they're talking in circles. And then they send me to uh, their customer service department, which is located in Mumbai or uh, New Delhi, or I don't know where it is, but it is not here in the United States. So after getting um, bounced back and forth between them, you know, I said, enough of this. I just want to cancel. And then they said that I can't cancel. And I'm thinking, look, there is no sort of verbal agreement that I can get in on the phone that will lock me in. No court of law. You know, I'm, 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 I'm doing all sorts of legal jiu-jitsu in my head. And I said, you know what, I know how to find people. So I found the CEO of this company. Well, I, I looked at their board of directors and uh, their, uh, their C-level staff. I found all of their contact information. And I went ahead and I just methodically called every single one of their C-level cell phones, leaving a message saying that, hey, look, I'm being, um, you know, uh, mistreated by your company and I need you know, I need this to be rectified. Then I contacted the Better Business Bureau, and I, I made an account of everything that happened. Uh, and then I went ahead and I reported them on Yelp. Um, I got on their Facebook page, and I started leaving uh, messages on all of their advertising for their free month of service. I, I left a very detailed note on all of the advertising for that. And then suddenly, suddenly, I get a call from a very uh, pleasant-sounding uh, woman who uh, assures me that um, the CEO and the various uh, vice presidents that I've contacted, they have heard my message um, on all of the outlets. They have seen uh, my messages, and they're very disturbed by um, how I was treated. 
and um, uh, you know they said that they're going to investigate to see what happened. And it just so happens that on the reporting that they have, they were able to determine that uh, my account manager uh, uh, did not tell the truth about what was hap- uh, about how I would be billed, um, and they found it fit to uh, uh, refund me or adjust. Uh, the invoice for 300 and some odd dollars, and then they uh, canceled my uh, contract with them. And I, I'll just say this. Look, if you are dealing with um, some of these vendors that are, if you're, a, I guess, self-employed or you're you know, going through any sort of entrepreneurial um, pursuits, understand that there is going to be people that will say everything that they know that you want to hear about what they can do for you. And even if they can't do it, or even if they're lying to you, they will get you to sign on dotted lines. They will get you to agree to things that you do not, uh, that, you know, you were not sold. Always, always, always try to pay with Visa because you can go ahead and dispute that. And then if you do have a problem with any of the services, you can just refuse to do business with them, and then you can proceed to do what I've done, and you can go ahead and contact every single person in their uh, in their um, um, in their hierarchy. You can alert them to um, exactly what is going on, and then you will get uh, you'll get the situation rectified. I was also um, I was also happy to see that the account manager that was responsible for uh, getting me on this program, I I went to the website to see if uh, they were still listed on this website, and uh, sure enough, uh, their uh, their page was taken down. So I'm only going to assume that this uh, this contact was fired, and um, and that's something that uh, that uh, has me very satisfied uh, about the outcome. Um, I did not have to pay a dime. I got, uh, you know, free service, however garbage the service was. And um, I, I definitely um, inconvenienced some uh, suspected white supremacists, and I made them very fearful about uh, what they are doing to so many small business uh, owners. And I made it known that they can be uh, found and they can be communicated with. Thank you so much. Great job, Mr. Steele. Uh, I've stated this uh, for years, even if you are, as they say, an entrepreneur, uh, racism, white supremacy is you know, still going to be an issue. You'll probably still need counter racist tactics. Uh, just don't think you will solve that problem <clears throat> by going into business for yourself. That said, <clears throat> great use of words. Uh, I know Dr. Kanban uh, is a big advocate of that. Uh, if you have a problem, some sort of issue to contact the, the CEO. Uh, go to as high as you can possibly go up the chain of command uh, to voice your concern about what happened uh, to get the person who can for sure remedy the situation and hopefully to your liking. Uh, but that sounds exactly it. Uh, I know I know some other folks, they are big advocates of that uh, in terms of writing and just not accepting uh, shoddy service. Write, call, all of the above. It might be time and energy, but Frequently, uh, if you're willing to invest that time and energy and use of words, you can get a lot of those situations uh, corrected. Sounds like that's what happened here. Job well done. And that's even a rare one because most of the time they do not take any sort of uh, punitive action. If an employee, according to to what you reported, they said that this person was not telling the truth uh, about how they explained your contract situation. Uh, It's been my experience that oftentimes those folks still are not fired. Uh, They will, you know, say something bad to them or say that we gave them a verbal reprimand or what have you and you know they go on and have a great career with the uh, company but great job and posting on folks if they have some sort of social media feed if they have a Facebook page or Twitter or whatever it is great to uh, post on their page as well uh, to address a concern grievance that can work well also uh, do we have other folks uh, on the line? If they either had questions, comments on what we've heard thus far, Mr. Steele, our caller in Ohio, if you had your own situation. Uh, oh, Mr. Thomas, can I say something about what Ken Steele? Um, yeah, what, what Ken Steele did was great. Um, and I, I commend him. Um, you always try to find that CEO. Um, and um, to, with social media, usually you have to send them a certified, and, and you know, they have to respond within certain 
for social media. I mean, you could, it's, it's your kid's out. Like, he trolled them hard, man. He, he wasn't playing. So um, I, I respect that. But what he said that was so important, I've noticed this in so many of my jobs, is that when you have knowledge of working at a place and working in a particular environment, you kind of see the background workings of things. And then when you're in that same type of environment, maybe at another place or, or you're not in your working capacity, you can see how they're, they're, they're lying and mistreating you. And um, he said he worked in that field and he knew that, that they had certain procedures that they could adhere to, but they were trying to upsell him, being that he knew that he didn't just fall for that. And just think of how many black people fall for that. Uh, I'll mute my line. Thank you. Absolutely. Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions, be detailed. And even if you don't get the information from them, uh, sometimes like in that situation, you can go and ask other folks questions. I think Mr. Steele said that he ultimately uh, sent out correspondence to the Better Business Bureau. There are other resources that you can contact uh, if you know, you're know you missing information. Sometimes that's going to be the case. Just try to ask questions. The more informed you are about your situation, the better you will be able to determine what you want to do to make things work out in your favor. Uh, we- oh, can I, can I, uh, can I uh, just give a little bit more information that can help uh, some um, victims real- about oh. this situation? Um, sure. And when you're a small business owner, um, oftentimes businesses will extend credit to you um, in, you know, the form of uh, services or, um, you know, longer agreements to, uh, to pay back. And if you don't pay uh, them back, they will report your business to the credit rating agencies that go ahead and uh, rate credit for businesses. And this can affect your ability to get business credit um, down the line. Uh, the um, credit rating agency that uh, is most commonly used for businesses is called Duns and Bradstreet. So your D and B score can be adversely affected when they send your company to collections to go ahead and collect on uh, um, uh, a past due accounts receivable. So they were going ahead, and the agent that uh, I was using, um, I I asked for their um, their superior. Their superior, their immediate superior, told me, yeah, go ahead and cancel your credit card and you won't get charged. But, but you will be, uh, you know, sent to collections and then you'll have to deal with our collections department. And once you're at the collections department, the problem is, okay, say they take your, uh, say they take your delinquent, uh, collections off the books or whatever. Well, uh, it, they're going to do that anyway if they go ahead and send it to collections because they send it to a, a debt collection agency. And then when they send it to a debt collection agency, they can go ahead and write off that bad debt on their end. So they can act as though on their books that they have the money that you were going, that you pledged to pay them. And they can go ahead and borrow against that and use that for their money. And then they can go ahead and send you in a situation where, you don't even, you can't even rectify this by contacting them. You have to contact the third party and who can go ahead and repackage and resell their, that debt onto another party. Uh, and then they can put another ding on your, uh, Duns and Brad C score. So this is just, uh, a game that they, uh, have played and then they have, uh, uh, scheduled in to their financial, uh, to, I guess their finances. So, they know that they're not going to collect on so many accounts because people are just going to cancel their credit cards. And then they know that they're going to go ahead and sell off a lot of these accounts, uh, a lot of the debt that uh, the accounts are receivable. They're going to uh, sell that off to a third party. So they're basically going ahead, and I'm, I'm guessing that they're running, um, uh, they're running a scheme that, um, is designed to rope you in with fake promises of free service and then that they're going to lock you in on this agreement and most people are not going to go and take the steps that I took to get this remedy. Um, uh, it's really disgusting and watch out for predatory services like this. 
Anytime you see free service or free anything, you have to understand that it's probably not free. And uh, anytime that they recommend that you go ahead and change your, you know, cancel your credit card or change your account number or something like that, that is not a fix for any of the problems that can arise from not paying uh, a a any of those invoices that um, are, are done in your name. So um, I just wanted to give that uh, a heads up to uh, any sort of uh, 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 small business owners that are, um, are doing business uh, um, with these larger marketing firms or any sort of um, services firm. Um, I'll go ahead and mute my line. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, <clears throat> Mr. Steele. Uh, it's been my experience that black people, they often have these sort of <clears throat> schemes to prey on black people in a variety of different ways. It would not surprise me <clears throat> if they have schemes set up specifically to target uh, black business owners, uh, small business owners that are black people or non-white people would not surprise me at all. Uh, if they don't have <clears throat> schemes that are set up specifically to target them uh, to do exactly as Mr. Steele said, exploit them, give you some really bad service and then charge you for it and all the rest. Uh, be mindful, ask questions, uh, try to be informed. Uh, we have other folks uh, who had a hand up that we've not heard from, have commentary they wanted to share. I guess. Oh, Stacy in London, chiming in. It is not Thanksgiving over there. You all do not have any sort of uh, wacky holiday going down over there today? No, not as far as I know. Grand. Um, <laughs> although it is leading up to Christmas, I guess, um, and it does start early over here as well. Um, hello to you and the rest of the <clears throat> excuse me, uh, callers. Um, not been able to join in um, for the last couple of weeks, even though I sort of attempted to. My sleep patterns are so disrupted, and I did want to join in the tail end of the last com uh, last week's uh, program, but there was a conversation I didn't want to interrupt. Um, I did um, hear last week there was a caller, I think, from Ireland who talked about his. Um, I guess success in inverted commas from a grievance process that he was going through and as you all know I've, I am currently going through a grievance with grievances with my organisation and I will um, in the future provide a more detailed update but um, I just wanted to briefly talk about wh where things are at um i think it's now week 10 that i have been out of the office um the human resource department decided that um they would let me know when i can come back in the organization and that has literally been done <coughs> on a week by week basis um and it's, a, it's a, you know when you're not in the, organ in the office and you're used to that sort of regular routine it's, it's easy to lose track of where things are at but i'm pretty certain give or take a week or so that it's uh 10 weeks now um i am but the, probably the last time i was physically in the office because i have popped in sort of on the odd day where i've had meetings with union reps or I've had to hand in paperwork. Um, I had um, maybe over a month ago now, anyway, um, a meeting with the HR lead. And essentially, why grievances are handled in the organisation that I work for, you, once you've handed in the information, it's reviewed and they can have one of two processes or yeah i think it's one or two processes where the grievance is handled either a hearing or an investigation and at the time and i have reviewed the policy it doesn't really go into detail about the difference between the two 
or what determines which route HR chooses to go down after you've handed in that information and they've reviewed it. So when I went in, the last conversation I had with HR lead was he was suggesting to me that needed to be a hearing and he was briefly explaining what that would mean. Um, now I have more than one person involved or that's been named in my grievance and there's in fact more than one grievance. I've got three running concurrently and um, I guess they're just trying to handle things as speedily or the plan was to handle things as speedily as possible allegedly and um, so was proposing to do it as a hearing each each grievance as a hearing and that includes the um, assault by the director which just seems very bizarre to me um, but I, I was actually quite taken aback by that proposal um, and in part it, the way it was presented to me is that because of the way that I had submitted or laid out the grievance is that um, it was difficult to determine like where one person is responsible and another person is respons um, responsible for each, each issue that I've raised. So rather than them having to go to each person separately to ask questions of each individual and that would be the investigation process they're proposing the hearing which essentially would mean I'm sat in a room with each of which with all of them and their representatives and um, basically there is a chair and the chair asks questions of all of us now for me, I was not happy about it because essentially it weights the whole thing in their favour, even though what they were, the, the HR person was telling me is that people are unlikely to misbehave in that kind of format, um, particularly um, with the chair present. But the fact is they are, you know, they're act they've been acting in a gang pretty much for the last three years so and certainly where they've been accusing me of various things they've been acting as a pack or a gang so the whole thing just weights it in their favor regardless of whether they're well behaved in inverted commas so I expressed my discomfort but the way it was presented to me was that it wasn't really optional had a conversation with my union rep and I did send the HR person an email and copied in my union rep anyway just because I'd let him know that I was coming back to him on that point because I wasn't happy about it I just wasn't going to debate it with him at the time I was going to go away and speak to my union rep because they were present in that meeting um, just to check what my um, uh, options that I had anyway so it turns out that actually HR can't impose a process um, first of all they didn't tell me and give me any particular format to, to submit the paperwork in any way but um, I have to agree to whatever's being proposed so with that in mind I said absolutely not um, and I think you know there was some turning from with my union I wasn't copied into all that correspondence um, and so they now have to go through the investigation format for each now as I said, it's been uh, pretty much 10 weeks now. And on the one hand, I'm being told, you know, they're being pressured to move things forward. But it's, you know, in as much as, yes, my, my union have been representing me and arguing things on my behalf, um, you know, I'm, I'm effectively not holding up the process. Um, so I gave dates of my availability. I think it's about a week and a half ago, and I haven't heard anything as yet. Um, I did speak to someone last week um, and I have it on good authority that, as I said, I have been, um, I have more than one grievance and more than one person named in each grievance, apart from obviously where the director has um, been violent against me. That's, that's just against that individual by himself. 
Um, and I understand that there is uh, an awful lot of infighting going on because in each grievance I've highlighted a number of issues especially where multiple people have been named. Um, it turns out they're all blaming in each other and also trying to blame other people across the organisations where there are procedural things, I believe, um, that I've highlighted. Um, I don't have all the detail because I wasn't given all of the detail. and I'm not, I guess, supposed to know everything. So there's only so far I can go with... Um, getting information out of somebody who's already given me too much information anyway. Um, now, I can only imagine that part of that is the reason why I haven't heard anything as yet. I don't know. It could be that HR is just being a bit lazy, but my I'm being told that they're being asked to move things forward as quickly as possible um, but you know as I said this is 10 weeks and that certainly doesn't feel swift to me and I've handed in my date for when I'm available over a week ago um, so yeah um, so I thought I'd give that update anyway not least because um, you know if, if there is anyone else listening to this hopefully it's useful just understanding that even once the grievance process is underway, be careful of what is being proposed, certainly in terms of, for my organisation anyway, the sort of hearing process versus the investigation. Um, and just be careful that, you know, HR, in their ease of convenience, and I think probably also slight underhandedness, um, trying to wait a process that means that you're, um, you know, it, well, it'd be weighted against you. You know, it's in the favour of the other parties. And I'm sure that the the, the racist um, suspects are, you know, advocating and manoeuvring with HR as far as they can to get things weighted in their favour. And he seems to be in awe of these individuals and their, their job titles and their status in the organisation. So no doubt um, he is influenced because he, 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 did, he keeps making comments to me about, you know, their seniority, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I just think whether it's knowingly or, um, you know, um, de deliberately being influenced by them, it means that, you know, even even midway through the process, things can be weighted against you. So it's, it's worth checking policy, as you always say, um, and making sure that you know your rights even within a process. And HR, sorry, in as much as in the past I have been sceptical of unions, and I, you know, I do still have some element of scepticism, they have been um, useful in certainly arguing points on my behalf um, when necessary. So I'll meet my line there, guys. Wow. Uh, Stacy in London, um, for folks, it is, uh, let's see, 2.40 a.m. Friday morning uh, in London, not Thanksgiving. I don't even know if it's Black Friday uh, over there uh, for, for today. Um, I do think it's really important because uh, with Stacy's situation, she's been telling us this has been going on for the longest, uh, it seems, uh, from the false allegations that were leveled against her, the violence, having multiple employees uh, shoving her in the hallway, uh, them, uh, the racists on her job, even employing uh, moles, getting black people to come uh, and oh, man, to participate in in the in the process. It's been uh, wow. It has been an odyssey uh, that is still unfolding. Uh, I think even uh, folks worldwide, I would definitely encourage uh, due process with Mr. Fuller uh, when he talks about uh, using the 15th and 14th Amendment. Uh, certainly you don't have a constitution over there, but I know they do have due process uh, in terms of uh, equal application of the law uh, being written down in terms of how folks are supposed to be treated. Uh, I think that can serve you well in the workplace. I think when Stacy was talking about uh, different points, uh, it feeling like they're manipulating the process. Certainly they've been functioning as a gang. Uh, that's another thing to be expected uh, where they're going to be working in cahoots 
uh, together uh, to look out for one another and that sort of thing, even though you said it seemed like they were trying to pass and, and blame other people. Uh, I've seen where that can happen as well. If it looks like someone might actually have to uh, get in trouble uh, for something incorrect that's occurred on the job. Uh, but generally, you're going to see a lot of racists working together, sharing information uh, and them trying to work as a unit to sabotage other black people. Uh, so expect that always uh, and due process, make a point of due process if at any point along the way uh is you know is this what the procedure is supposed to be uh like be really familiar that's why i stress reading policy and procedure read that in advance uh so then you're just doing a review if something should happen uh, as opposed to having to read things for the first time uh, but really emphasize due process and pointing out if if there's any sort of deviation uh you know this could be a major violation uh, and and sabotaging the company's own policy uh you know really uh make a point of that i think that can be helpful in the workplace environment uh do we have folks either who had uh question their own situation that they wanted to address if you have a uh, hand up feel free Can I be heard? Retired firefighter. Good to hear from you, sir. Greetings, sir, and greetings, everyone. Uh, just listening to the program and uh, just had uh, a thought. Uh, for instance, tomorrow's program, uh, you spent about maybe an hour uh, uh, uh uh, collecting the uh, uh, racist acts of white people uh, from the prior week, you actually can can fill up the whole three hour show, <laughs> and I know you'd understand this uh, with that that report that you make. And the reason why I brought it up is because most of these most of these white people who are the culprits of each one of those. Uh, uh, incorrect activities are in the workplace. <laughs> they are they are in the workplace, and uh, I don't think their behavior is that much different than when they're not in the workplace. Uh, because some of some of these uh, acts of racism that you report are actually on the job itself, on the job itself, and and for the most part, a lot of these white people there, it's not like they are the sanitation worker. Or something like that. They, uh, in a couple of cases uh, that I've heard over the years, uh, uh, they are registered nurses, uh, uh, doctors, or in med school uh, who are, who are uh, behaving in this particular way and abusing non-white people. Uh, and I and my thoughts are in the line of on how important this program is how important this program is not just your program but anybody else who is who has the 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 thoughts and the ambitions to want to try to put together some kind of organized effort where non-white people are just talking and sharing their experiences about racism in the workplace another reason why i say that is this is that this is something that most of us have to uh attend uh it, some workplace somewhere, uh, and in that case, you have a situation where white people have us in a confined space, in a confined space where they're looking at you and you're looking at them, and they are experimenting on us on a daily basis, uh, on on subtle as well as uh, very obvious ways of mistreatment. So I, I I just just had that thought. I wanted to share that with you and everybody else on the on the line, or everybody else that that may be on the line and, and not participating. Is that this is this is some this is I, I would say it, it is somewhere in the top three or four things that we should be doing. <laughs> it's sharing experiences and trying to come up with means the most efficient means in order to to correct and or solve. Uh, the problem. Uh, last but not least, uh, another thought that's kind of like briefly it was on my mind. You know, with all this talk about uh, uh, quote unquote sexual abuse, 
when a white person does that to a non-white person, that's an act of racism, period. Uh, as far as that concerned, uh, anybody who has uh, suggestions, thoughts on what's the most efficient way when that takes place in that confined space that I call a workplace, uh, I'm, I'm, my ears are open to uh, listen to what kind of thoughts that uh, uh, we may have on, on that subject uh, within the workplace. Thank you. Thank you. Can I heard? Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, one of the um, things that, uh, um, one of the techniques that uh, I've used in, uh, to deal with uh, unwanted touching and uh, especially unwanted uh, sexual advances on the job um, is that you can go ahead and make it very awkward and uncomfortable for the person uh, that is uh, trying to engage in that behavior that you are not a willing participant. Um, you can basically say, uh, uh, don't touch me. Uh, you know, that's a, a basic one. I think uh, Gus uh, uh, recommends, you know, just making it very clear that uh, you do not want to be touched. That alone can cut off so much of the uh, of the the bad behavior that goes on um, in an office setting. Just setting those boundaries and being very clear about those. Like uh, another another thing that you can do is uh, a greatly exaggerated uh, you know pull away of your body. So if you're in a confined space or you know, you're in a uh, situation where they're cornering you and, you know, attempting to touch you. And oftentimes these situations, they're going to try to establish that it's okay for them to do it. So if you immediately establish that it's not okay by wincing, pulling, you know, or having a, um, an evasive uh, maneuver that is just exaggerated, that usually just makes it awkward and uncomfortable enough for the, the predatory suspected racist to uh, uh, to think twice about um, what uh, you know uh, behavior that they're about to engage in, and also I just want to uh, um, make note that in my time uh, working with corporate America, I've uh, come to learn that uh, the uh, suspected racist view uh, their time at work. Uh, much differently than uh, we victims of racism. Uh, during They kind of uh, view work as um, another room in their house or another, uh, another setting in which they are uh, able to uh, go ahead and do whatever it is that they are going to do. Um, and when it comes to... Uh, sexual harassment on the job, I just noticed that suspected racists are very comfortable engaging in um, intra-office uh, relationships. Um, they're very comfortable, uh, you know, making uh, uh, sexually suggestive comments and, and gestures, and uh, they are very comfortable doing um, behaviors that uh, we would or that we as a society have come to uh, mark as sexual assault. Um, you know, just the kind of what they, when they do it, they call it groping or, um, you know, sort of a perverted behavior. They are able to uh, engage in that sort of behavior nonchalantly uh, on the job. And uh, I just want to remind uh, victims of racism that you are not afforded uh, that same latitude, and you are uh, are constantly being uh, monitored for any sort of uh, any sort of uh, uh, sexual misgivings on the job. So uh, I recommend just one more time, uh, you know, strict enactment of the Mike Pence rule. Uh, you know, only 
only uh, concern yourself with uh, or involve yourself with the you know opposite sex in public settings, uh, and um, do not do not uh, go on sort of you know work dates or try to have any sort of uh, work related meals that are separate from uh, the uh, other coworkers or anything like that. Um, don't go to your coworkers' hotel rooms on trips, things like this. Um, you know, because uh, as we're seeing now, um, you know, what is uh, cool now could easily uh, be very, very, very uncool and possibly even criminal, um, you know, later. So, um, you know, just uh, follow the Mike Pence rule when it comes to dealing with the opposite sex in the workplace. And uh, this is a, a very effective way of avoiding some of the pitfalls that have befallen some um, other victims of racism um, that we've been uh, seeing um, uh, unfolding the news. Uh, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and mute my line. Appreciate that, Mr. Steele. Uh, absolutely. I do say that. I've said that. I think Emmy uh, has said that as well. If it's any sort of uh, hugging, unwanted touching, anything like that, immediately uh, pull away. You know, do not touch me. Uh, make it very clear. I'm also a big advocate of not uh, being alone, uh, especially opposite sex. If you're a black female, I would make it bedrock code. I'm not going to be alone uh, with a white man. And that might go for males, period. If I'm a black male, I'm not going to be alone uh, with any white women on the job. Uh, and just keep that in mind. It's no fraternizing. Uh, as Mr. Steele said, you know, I, I've seen a lot of that on jobs where white people are having affairs and sleeping around with everybody uh, at the job and nobody was terminated. Nothing was said uh, about all of this. Uh, do not think as a black person that you can emulate that behavior and not have problems. Uh, I think that would be uh, a smart code to adapt as well to just I do not fraternize I'm not paid I'm not here uh, this is not <laughs> an opportunity for me to hook up uh, or what have you that's not what this is about I'm here to do my job and go home uh, it's best to keep that separate in, in my uh, experience to help keep down allegations of that I think we had someone the caller in Alabama was saying that it was a black female on the job she was in some sort of uh, arrangement with a black male on the job things went bad and then that ended up being a work place race or excuse me workplace problems so yeah i think just all of that you don't know, don't engage in any of that on the job i'm here to do business and that way anybody who is you know talking or or speaking to you in that vein they are way 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 out of line uh we had a person who wrote in us uh, our one of our listeners in wisconsin black female uh she said after working outside my home after, excuse me, after not working outside my home for over a year, I started working at the end of August for a call center. My 90 day probation would have been at the end of November. During this time, I was asking a lot of questions about what certain things mean and how certain things work and who can I talk to concerning hours, codes and calling. I was asking a lot of questions because there were a lot of contradictory events happening. One of the first events to happen is not getting paid on time. That's a big one. Our whole training class did not get paid and they gave some lame excuse why. We eventually got paid five days later. There were all kinds of rules being broken by other co-workers. A big one was the dress code. Although there were a lot of co-workers who violated the code, I noticed that only certain people were singled out by being sent home. I was not surprised. I just made sure I adhered to the rules. I was asking questions about what certain codes meant on the computer, but was told by people in charge that they didn't know and that they would ask someone who might know. I was asking questions because I wanted to make sure that I knew whatever I needed to know to do my job and learn more about the company. Today, I asked someone who I knew was the site manager about a code and what it meant and also asked him why did I have call activity on my computer for yesterday when I was off yesterday. He responded that it was an anomaly and to screenshot it and we would look we would look into it later. Right at the end of my shift, I was called over by my team lead and led into the HR office. I had no idea what it was about and found out that I was being terminated 
for accessing information on the computer that they said I should not have. I told them that I was accessing the information for a customer who wanted to know how to navigate through a music app. That didn't matter. I should have gone into the equipment room to look into for the customer. Listening to the program, I am not surprised by what happened. I did not know that this was a violation. We were told to use any tool available to help the customer. The app that I used is on every computer. I did not download or access any of my personal information. I think because I think because I was asking the same questions about what certain things mean to different people in higher positions, I was terminated. I have accessed this information since working there and was never told that I could not access that app to help customers. What I've learned is that no matter what you can is no, no matter what, you can be fired for anything even if it's just asking questions. Hmm caller in Wisconsin, black female caller in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm sorry to hear uh, about the termination uh, to be expected. Uh, that is the plan, I think, uh, for racists to just keep black people unstable uh, so that we don't feel financially secure, uh, don't feel secure with regards to our career and, and just to keep us in, in that permanent state of chaos where we can't even think clearly because we've got so many disruptions to deal with. Uh, however, with this situation, uh, anytime where you just start a job, you're on the probationary period and there's already a payroll problem, that might be them doing you a favor. Uh, I would not feel comfortable. I mean, the whole reason that you take a job is to get a paycheck. If in the first like days of me working here, there's a payroll problem and not just like a me thing like, oh, man, you know, I'm missing out on twenty five dollars. You know, I might have to only have four lattes this week instead of three. Everybody <laughs> misses out on their pay. And for five days, I mean, my gosh, for some people like that could be huge problems like you know it's it's never you never want to be out of a job where it's not your doing uh where you you know this is my choice i have a plan i already knew i was going to be leaving and things are great i am so excited i cannot wait to leave that's the way that you want to you know walk away from uh, a position uh, as opposed to to being leave for us that was not your plan but wow, uh, this sounds like uh, kind of a chaotic environment, an unprofessional environment uh, and a dangerous environment. I mean, if they're messing with the pay and then you're seeing discretionary enforcement of policy, some people get these dress code violations and some people don't. Uh, this, I don't know, might not sound like the type of place that you would want to be in on a long term basis. But uh, I still, in my view, asking questions uh, and just getting answers. And again, you're not going in grilling anybody like you got an army behind you and being surly about it, but asking questions, you can be courteous and do your thing, but asking questions, <laughs> getting information is extremely helpful. What does this code mean? What does this mean? Do you know uh, how why it is that my computer is showing that someone was, you know, logged in uh, when I was not here yesterday. Do you know what's up with that? Asking questions, asking questions. I think uh, employers should be happy to have curious employees who want to be well informed so that they can perform their job to the best of their ability. Uh, anybody think uh, the person that wrote in anybody think she did anything incorrect or anything she could have done differently in the situation? No commentary. Go ahead. Other folks, uh, if they had a hand up, if you have your own uh, situation that you would like to discuss, you should be with us. Uh, Emmy as well. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, greetings, everyone. I must apologize. I missed a bit. And um, I came right back when you were saying if there was anything that the CMO could have done differently. Could you just give me the rundown really quick of what it was that happened? She was on a job. She was still in her 90 day probationary uh, period. It was a call center 
type job. She said she was asking questions about, you know, policy and procedure that she didn't understand. I think there were certain computer codes that she did not understand. There was a, there was an issue with, uh, I think her computer was used and it was, her computer was used on a day that she did not work. Uh, and so she had questions about that. Uh, and then they terminated her. And the reason that they gave was that she, uh, used some sort of program or an app on the computer that she was not supposed to use. Uh, she said this, the app that she used, this was apparently while she was helping a customer. Uh, she was looking at the rules for whatever this music thing was. Uh, she said this app is on all of the computers uh, at the facility and that she had not been told that this was a violation. She didn't even know that this was you know, something that you were not supposed to do. Uh, but uh, she said she her conclusion was that you can be terminated from a job just for asking questions. Uh, and so I asked if, if folks thought she did anything incorrect or if there's anything she could have done differently in this situation. Also, she, she included the, the first detail that within the first, I guess, pay period, she was not paid and it wasn't just her. It was the entire, I guess, class of people that they hired and were training did not get paid. They were five days late uh, paying them. That was included as well. I thought that was important because my assessment was that they might have done her a favor, um, allowing her to leave. But yeah, that's the short and tall of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I must agree that perhaps that situation ending could be to your benefit and to just let it go. Um, but if this is some type of like career opportunity, I don't, you know, I usually don't carry things far um, but I mean, if there's an app that's on all of the computers, how are you supposed to know that you're not allowed to access the app? That just seems logical to me. Like if it's there, it seems like it must be okay to be there if it's a company computer. Um, and if it's like a job that you need or want or something like that, I guess maybe writing a letter to the people above the people who terminated you. I don't even know if there are people above, like if this is like maybe a small call center kind of thing and there isn't, you know, different tiers of um, hierarchy and power and whatnot. But, I mean, if it's something that you've kind of like decided, eh, whatever, moving on, then they were just practicing racism. And I do think that you can get fired for asking questions. I think there's enough evidence to suggest that we can get fired for any reason. Um, and questions is definitely... One, because questions um, allow people to see that you're thinking, and I don't, there's enough evidence to suggest that companies, corporations, white people don't want thinking black people um, on the job in the workplace. They just want robots. Um, yeah, I think that's where I'll leave it for here. I wanted to comment on the uh, clip that you played earlier in the beginning of the call, Gus, with uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. He said something that I just wanted to pull out and highlight um, that we're not at the job for anything. Well, and I'm paraphrasing, but he was pretty much saying that we're at the job to conduct research or to learn or to observe, but not for anything else, not for the title, not for the money, not for the power of prestige, not to be liked or anything else but to conduct counter-racist research and observations. And that resonates for me very strongly because that is what I hold on to more than anything else. Um, and so, unfortunately, I endure uh, things I don't want to endure for that purpose. That, number one, this is to get from point A to point B, but I'm also able to conduct research, not to be redundant, but to make my observations. Um, I don't really know. I, I did miss a considerable part of the conversation, so I do apologize if there's like a bunch of other people's things I haven't been able to comment on or offer any any um, suggestions if they needed it. But um, I will say like nothing new has happened um, on either of the, plan of the plantations that I'm a part of, but um, I did listen to the conversation yesterday about not letting it hit the floor. And um, I've admitted before 
But I think just for my own purposes here, getting to the close of 2017, as Gus says, um, that in part it is so that I can conduct my research, right, my, my silence and my desire to be uh, invisible so that I can just, like, get in and get out and do what I need to do. But in part, another part of it is that there's a lot of fear. I have a lot of fear about what doing, if I did certain things, what would happen. And because I don't have the kind of control I would want to have, then I just won't because it's a risk I'm not necessarily willing to take. Now, how that's affected the situation, oh, this is Emmy. I'm out here in the DMV area. I'm in school. I also TA for the racist white woman. So um, as I've observed that situation, the TA situation, um, it just escalates more and more and more. And so in one respect, if I was able to be silent and it didn't escalate, then this would be constructive. Like I was able to keep it at a minimum. This is something I tolerate, whatever be done. But it just gets worse. And for me, she is aggressive and violent. And um, I just wanted to say that. Like, so what I did is we have, you know, the horror day um, vacation or whatever they call, call it. So I got a couple days, which I really needed because I've been running really hard and I'm tired. And um, I just couldn't even make it like the last day. I was like, you know what? There's really no need. Nobody's even in class, so I don't really need to be there. And so I sent her an email, and I was going to be late. I was like, something happened on the road. I was going to be like 15 minutes late. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be so late. I'm going to be disruptive to the class, so I will just see you next week. This was on Tuesday. So I sent the email because I'm not coming on Wednesday because I don't have no classes, and I'm not coming just for that, like, cost me more in gas money than the one hour I get, you know what I'm saying? So no, I'm not doing that. I didn't put, I was far more professional in the email. And, um, you know, she didn't respond. And that's cool. Like, I, hey, I get it. Like, I don't respond to her emails either. But I'm, it's given me anxiety because I know what to expect on Monday. So even now, being that it's Thursday, I've been like mentally preparing myself for the terrorism that I'm going to have to endure for the next two to three weeks for this semester to end. I received an email from the white coordinator. Now, I know it says that it was sent to everybody in the group, all of the TAs, but I'm no fool. There are ways that you can uh, control who you send it to, but what it says in the two part of the email will read math, whatever, but it could have only been sent to a couple people. It doesn't mean that it was sent to everybody, if, if I'm being clear. In this email, it states that in the upcoming semester, there won't be as many math courses that are being offered and that they're going to have grad students who are now going to be doing part of this TA. So all the TAs who want to TA again will not be able to TA. Now, I had already made up in my mind that I was not going to TA. Uh, number one, because the terrorism and all that stuff, there are no non-white math professors. So I don't get, that's not an option. Number two, um, this is more than I bargained for. Like, I just want to help non-white people with math. Number three, there are more ways for me to help non-white people with math where I could just be around all non-white people. Like, I could just go to a black high school and do it there. Number four, I don't really get paid that much. Number five, it's taking away from my studies. Like, the reason I'm in school is to get to the end not necessarily for all of these twists and turns in the middle. So I'd already made up in my mind that I wasn't going to TA in the upcoming semester, but when I got that email, I interpret that as having been sent to really me, like with this conversation in mind, um, and to not TA again. Now, I'm not really sure if anyone wants to comment, that's completely fine, but I just wanted to update you all on that, that um, yes, I don't want to let it hit the floor no more. Um, I'm not trying to take it home. I don't want to be thinking about this. Um, silence is constructive, but sometimes it does escalate. Like your silence does not mean that it will just stop right there and end. Um, oh, I'll say this just because other women have mentioned it. Like I'm, I have natural hair. I have a big fro, but I love to do things with my hair. Um, that's just me. I do. So every time I switch my hair, doesn't matter where I sit, she will literally find some way to squeeze between me and the wall to stand behind me and, like, stare at my hair. And I just keep thinking about that, you know what I mean? 
and what that's doing to me. I'm doing my best to, um, I go to the gym. I don't offer that up as just like something to tell other people to do, but, you know, to be healthy and to keep my mind clear. But the stress is real. Moving on. I also work in a pharmacy, and um, I was supposed to go to work, so I, I went to work, and I have to still get this, like, override to clock in. So I was like, hey, can you give me the override? And the woman was like, oh, well, the pharmacy is closed because of some, you know, system update. And I was like, oh, okay, works for me. I guess I must have forgot. I'm super stressed and tired. Like, whatever, I'll go home. So I get a call the next day, and they're like, so where are you? And I'm like, well, what are you all talking about? Where am I? I'm like, it's Friday. I'm not supposed to be at work. And they were like, well, where were you yesterday? And I was like, I came in yesterday. So I literally had to be like, y'all need to run the cameras back. I came in, and what's-your-face told me to go home. So whatever conversation that y'all need to have should be with her because I came in and she told me to go home. So just thinking about those things, I like how every little turn, there's an assumption that the non-white person has done something incorrect or wrong. Um, and the one the final thing I wanted to say is the checks that are there to, like, catch us up, I like to use them. For instance, in the pharmacy, you know, people be stealing drugs and stuff. Everything I take, I leave it right underneath the cash register. So, like, if I have, like, food, a bottle of water, my cell phone, some lotion, because I stay washing my hands, it all stays right underneath the register. Why? Because there's a camera there. How does that benefit me? I'm not taking nothing. Everything I have is right here at the register. Every time I go to put lotion, drink for my water, it's right there on camera, right at the register, what I'm doing. Maybe it'll help other people, but it works for me. I just be like, run the camera back. <laughs> just run the camera back. I don't have nothing to do with nothing. I'm just trying to make my couple of nickels and go home. So um, that's all I have for now. I really do appreciate you all for listening to me. Hmm. Wow. Like that. Use the camera. If there's recording there, use it to your advantage, particularly doing the correct thing. Use it to your advantage. Uh, although I will, I guess the technology is advancing so much. It, it might, there might come a time where uh, manipulating that sort of video becomes really, really easy and really, really widespread. But uh, at least for the time being, absolutely uh, take advantage and uh, use the cameras to your advantage. Uh, and the stress, I will comment on that. I have heard that from lots of folks for lots of different holidays or vacations, whatever it is, that they are so stressed that they are not able to enjoy that time off uh, because they're thinking about all the terrorism that they're going to have to deal with uh, once they get back. So. Yeah, I can I can totally empathize. That is white terrorism uh, and that is black mental health. Uh, the assault is constant just to keep you unbalanced, confused, stressed, constant. Uh, that is that is what is uh, being done. That's part of the war. I suspect that white woman, your T.A., probably did. <laughs> we need to have fewer of these niggers. I can't believe her. She's been in here. She's late every other day and is acting wild. She's got this wild, frizzy kinky hair and all of yeah we, we don't we can slash that we can have about 50 percent fewer tas and you know get her out of here would not surprise me uh at all um if other folks particularly she might even be picking up on that yeah and she has the audacity to seem like she really cares about these black students like i'm not trying to promote or encourage that at all uh other folks that uh dialed in with the hand up they have commentary Uh, yes, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners and callers. I have um, about four incidents, and these are uh, about um, statements made by uh, um, mainly white women and one white man. The first one is uh, a situation where I was uh, walking past the um, the black male supervisor that I uh, usually am cool with. Uh, he, I think he had stepped away for a while. Uh, and his first statement was from a white man who does the uh, IT, the computer tech stuff. And he, you know, I, like I had walked past his office and, you know, this guy, he turn, turns and he says, says, yeah, well, you know, I'm in, uh, 
you know. I just, you know, I just spoke or whatever, and he and then he just goes in to say, yeah, you know, um, you know, I know, I know that she know, I don't look like, you know, he used the the guy's name, the black male's name. He says, uh, I'm his twin. I'm the white version of him. You know, I'm his white twin. Um, and he says, you know, he just goes into this, you know, list of details talking about, you know, but I could be an alien. And, uh, you know, and, you know, Blank could have a doppelganger walking around here. So, you know, be on the lookout, <laughs> you know, if you see, uh, if you see somebody that looks, you know, identical to him, cause you know, I'm one of them. Uh, like I, I like, I started to think about how when Mr. Fuller was saying like how they'll just come up with all kind of ways to just throw, um, you know, a bunch of words at you try to, you know, confuse you in some kind of way. It was just a bunch of babbling, but it was uh, kind of, uh, I'm trying to figure out the word for it, like kind of, um, I won't say weird, I would say uh, racist, um, making it seem like he was calling a black person an alien. Uh, but yeah, he just randomly just came out and said that. Uh, the this, this second one was, and this is this has been going on for a good little while. Uh, there was a white woman who was talking to a black female. You know, they were talking about, um, you know, gold teeth. And and I'm thinking, you know, this person, this white supervisor, was saying that you know some guy she now this is the statement she made. Okay, she said that. A you know a, a guy she didn't say what his racial classification was, but you know I'm thinking that they speaking a the code you know, and you know a black female was talking about how she dated a guy, you know who had goals okay, and you know this guy tried to the white woman says this guy tried to holler at her, and you know and she said that uh, descriptively he had gold teeth. And she said it would be weird because if I were to kiss him, it would be like kissing a robot. Um, and, you know, the two of them laughed and she walked back in her office. And uh, I, I think um, I think you mentioned it before. I think where you had one guy on the program, I think it was the Kevorkian person who I think was um, like mentioning movies, I think about how black people are um, compared to robots as well. Uh, and the third was, a, a, like, another white woman was talking about how there was, a, a like, a black male out in the uh, plaza area, and he was randomly approaching, uh, I think it was a white woman, and, you know, she said that, he asked her to, I guess, uh, walk her to her car or something like that. And she said she thought it was bizarre that when she, uh, I guess, reported it to a, you know, one of the security guards that, <laughs> that uh, you know, said, you know, you should have called 911, you know. Um, but she said, well, I was just trying to report it to my coworker that she sits next to the other uh, white woman that sits behind me. And, you know, she said she thought it was bizarre that they told her, well, if it didn't work with her, you should have called 911. And, you know, she was basically, I don't know, it could have been her bragging too, I guess, getting some kind of attention. Um, and the, uh, the, the last one, the fourth statement was, I think the most powerful one, uh, this happened a few days ago. Uh, there was a conversation between these two, actually these two uh, same white women, uh, early 20s. Um, they were talking about this case where someone called up and, and like, this guy, he is uh, on, I guess, like $2 million bond or whatever. And... Uh, I guess this one white woman was saying, I guess she had some kind of, you know, 
a friend or associate that knew the person who this black person, I guess, is accused of killing. Um, and, uh, you know, she was saying, like, yeah, this white girl is just turned totally ghetto and she she likes black guys and then, you know, trying to backtrack. Well, you know, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with liking black people and stuff. And, you know, she just likes these thugs. And uh, I see, uh, like, while she's saying this, what I try to do is I just, uh, I wanted to know, like, how the other white people are going to act. So the other white woman is being totally silent, you know, so she goes on to say, yeah, she just likes these thugs. And, uh, you know, she went and got this guy's ta uh, name tattooed on her on her neck. And uh, she's posting selfies saying free such and such. And, you know, his family's, uh, she, she used the term hick, okay? Uh, she said her, her family is a hicks. And uh, they said if he were to ever get out, that they would go looking for him. And she said that they are racist and that they would publicly, like, uh, hang him, all right? And, like, so I just asked the question. Uh, I said, so you mean like a, uh, like a public lynching or something? And she says, yeah, you know, if they were to put that on the news, you know, y'all can say that I called it. And I say, well, should I be surprised? And then she... <laughs> She, you know, she just went back to doing her work. That was like two questions I asked, um, and like that, was, that was all of the uh, incidents and statements that I observed this week. And thanks for allowing me to share. Wow, I thought white people were ignorant about racism. Uh, a whole lot of that seems like you would have to be kind of informed about white supremacy in order to make some of those comments. Uh, even even when she started off, before we even get to family, would hang them, take them out and hang them and all that. Uh, even to start that off by saying, oh, she's just throwing our life away. She's dating black guys. I mean, nothing, you know, I love Martin Luther King. But she's dating all these thugs and even that right there <laughs> to be like, wait a minute. I don't know if I should even say that she's dating black guys. They might think I'm racist. Let me see if I can clean that. Even that, <laughs> you would have to have some sort of information about racism with regards to what you're supposed to say, what you're not supposed to say if you're a white person. The portion, the I think it was the it was so many <laughs> like they didn't take a break for the holiday. I think the second one where. You said that uh, it was a different white woman where she was saying that a uh, guy tried to holler at her. And we talked about this before where white people start using uh, slang in the workplace. Uh, that's like stereotypical black talk uh, when they start doing that in the workplace as another way that they practice racism. Uh, and yeah, this guy tried to holler at me and he had gold teeth and be like kissing a robot or whatever. Totally uh, Dr. Kevorkian, uh, Color Monitors. That's the exact thesis of uh, his book. He's an admitted white supremacist, too, but that is the exact thesis of his book uh, that racist whites, they see uh, black people, non-white people as uh, non-humans, robots, machines, that sort of thing. And it even stands out to me, if you're repulsed by this person, why are you thinking about kissing them? That right there, when you said, I think that was it was the third incident where they were saying, oh, you should have got the police, whatever. I think even that second one was the white person bragging. I think uh, particularly white women, uh, I think they like to brag about having some sort of sexual power, even if it is imagined, fabricated over black people to even put that idea out that, oh yeah, this this black guy was just trying to get at me and oh, blah, blah, and all that to just get some sort of sense that they are sexually powerful, sexually desirable uh, to promote that uh, and to kind of be low-key bragging uh, about, you know, yeah, I get all this sexual attention from black guys. She could have been lying uh, about the whole situation, but again, in my view, just even the fact that she would be thinking about that hypothetically about kissing this person, in my view, says quite a bit. Uh, I will stop there. Uh, oh, great questions. I forgot. Great questions. There were so many great questions about comparing. Uh, they would take them out and uh, hang them. The one, the situation where uh, this white woman was being lamented because she's into black guys and all this stuff. And uh, where she said her family was 
racist and you know they would they would tell well, i don't know if she said they were racist but they would take this guy out and hang him they totally would not approve great question comparing this to a lynching uh and again once it's serious seems like this black person is asking questions man i am gonna find something to do i am not gonna continue this conversation moving along i've seen that as well consistently workplace and beyond uh you start asking questions being serious racial matters white people know i need to go ahead and terminate this conversation leave this nigger alone uh we have other folks who had questions comments they wanted to make sure they got in Turkey has subdued folks for the day. Grand. Certainly, uh, the work situation, if folks have updates, you can drop an email. I'm looking forward to Wisdom of Psychopaths tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Kevin Dutton, man, oh, man. <laughs> talk to, again, I talked to Dr. Rossian, who suggested the book, and uh, he said, uh, he told us to keep reading. Uh, that was recommendation number one, that it gets even better uh, towards the end. He thought there would be a, a special treat for Cow's listeners if we can make it to the conclusion of the book. So uh, I am tickled and looking forward to tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I think we already got a mention for the compensatory call in. 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific this coming Saturday. Uh, we were supposed to have a white person on the program this Sunday, but he has a new book published. It has not arrived. The mail obviously didn't run today, run today, so it looks like I might not have the book in time, so we might have to reschedule. Uh, so just have to play touch and go uh, with that. But at minimum, we'll be here tomorrow. Uh, give it a few more moments, see if uh, folks have any other comments they want to make sure they get in with regards to workplace racism uh folks are done they are just all tuckered out from eating and gallivanting around town and all of the other festivity activities that went on for today or people might even be shopping i've seen where the time moved it used to be that they had the black friday sales and what have you it started at like friday morning at like 5 a.m they moved it to midnight now it's at like six i think i saw an advertisement today where you could go shopping the malls were opening at 6 p.m so people could be out and doing their black friday shopping today on thursday already uh but number again 641-715-3640 code 564-943 pound press star 61 if you have commentary i uh, will do about five minutes and unless uh -huh. Stacy in the UK. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I just wanted to comment on um, the, the last email that you read and the person who was terminated while they were on their probationary period um, after asking questions. Um, I mean, I, I think I agree that it probably doesn't sound like a place that he or she wanted to be at for too long because it sounds like there's a lot of questionable practices there anyway. But it was just the point about um, noticing that the computer had been used while um, that person was not in the office and then raising that with the supervisor. Um, obviously everything in hindsight. My my advice for anyone else sort of listening into that example or for future practices, you know, maybe as she was asked to do to screenshot it but i wouldn't have necessarily raised it with the uh, supervisor anyway because unless you're directly being accused of anything um what is the purpose of raising it you were not in the office and i don't say that to sort of accuse or anything but it's just um just to say you were not in the office the day before um, so long as you keep track of the fact that you were not in the office, take a screenshot for your own record, um, and should it come up in the future, then you've got your evidence. But we don't need to always raise an issue. Sometimes you have to let um, the um, racist suspects come to you with accusation, um, not least because maybe it was the supervisor who was doing something inappropriate anyway. Um, and he, she may have made that person feel uncomfortable about whatever it is that they're up to. But yeah, so 
that would just be my word of advice for the future or for anybody who's in a similar situation um just be cautious yeah we can log information but we don't always need to make a point of phrasing it um it may not lead to anything in the future but if it does at least you've got your own evidence there to support you should any issues arise i'll meet my line cast logical suggestion uh from stacy in the uk again our Timestamp uh, 331 a.m. Friday morning, London time. Uh, but yeah, great suggestion uh, on that one. Uh, it's something <clears throat> for those type of situations. And again, it's not thinking, oh, this is going to be fine. I'm not going to have a problem, but just I'm going to allow them to bring this up. I'll wait for them to make an accusation that I've done something wrong or to question me with suspicion. And then I can reveal my evidence. I got my screenshot and whatever other information. This is, you know, whatever you need to verify. I did not work this day. If I called out or I wasn't even scheduled, have your printout of the schedule. I didn't even work this day. You can go back and, you know, look at the time clocks or whatever information. However, people have that information stored. Check the camera. <laughs> as uh, as Emmy said, I didn't even, I wasn't even here that day. <clears throat> but that's, that's one I think people can think about and employ as well. <clears throat> and I think we said that with... Uh, racist jokes like you can use that in a lot of different ways if they make a violation against you you can do the same thing log it wait then you can either you can pick the time when you want to bring it up or if they bring something up down the road you can just have that information stored uh, where you can bring it up at your convenience uh, any other commentary folks want to make sure they get in uh, workplace racism related folks satisfied i would say that uh uh the, i believe uh it was a caller from florida the other call from florida uh when the white females was was uh giving their stories uh i think he had the correct response by uh asking questions uh which is something that i think that uh, we need to lead the world in is asking questions because also, when you ask questions to another person, you become uh, on the offensive and the person that is you're asking the questions to uh, is on the defensive. And being that there are a lot of white people who do not admit that they are racist, uh, that are actually practicing racism, uh, it will... Uh, expose them to the point to whereas they would probably walk away from you <laughs> in some cases uh because they would uh would be exposed uh as such uh in that light uh by asking questions and so that's always a is a good uh workplace uh strategy uh when you in company uh in the company of white people who are just talking 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 Absolutely. It's been my experience. If you ask questions, even if you just ask one or two questions a week, sometimes whites will cut down the amount of talking that they do around you. You have a lot less idle chit chat once they see that, oh, man, this nigger is, is paying attention and might even ask a question or two. We'll wait till they take lunch and then we can spread a little gossip or get a few nigger jokes in while they're out. But Ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. That is uh, chief, one of our chief weapons allies uh, as attempted counter racists. Uh, and check your pillow for urine, apparently, uh, courtesy of uh, uh, Mr. William Clark, who was on the broadcast yesterday. Man, if you live, I think said that before, if, you know, for firefighters and other folks, if you are in that unfortunate position where if you have to share lodging with racists as a part of the work conditions that's going to require a whole nother level of codification uh, which is exactly what he said yesterday which might involve all kinds of things like checking your pillow for urine uh, or you know whatever else you need to do to stay safe uh, in the environment but definitely uh, there's got to be a code and just making sure that we don't because uh, I hear from so many people either when they call in or people that email or write or if I talk to people <clears throat> off the air, people that do have an understanding of racism, white supremacy, they grasp at some level what's happening. They grasp at some level that we do have enemies, white people, racist man, racist woman, racist child, 
But somehow, some way, they end up on the job. And again, all of us, that is a difficult situation. You want to be able to make as much uh, income as you can to take care of yourself and your family. So you want to keep that job. That doesn't mean that you forget everything and or that you fail to apply counter racist concepts when you are in that environment. The least of which, regardless of how cool or how nice they happen to be for a week, for a year, for five years, I'm still going to be extraordinarily suspicious. There are certain things that I do, certain things that I don't do uh, in this environment. It doesn't have anything to do uh, with anyone individually. This is just based on my understanding of racism, white supremacy and the danger that I am in anytime I'm behind enemy lines on the job. Uh, I think just being able to be in that frame of mind uh, on a regular basis, I think that puts us in a much better position uh, on the job. Uh, any other commentary folks want to make sure they get in? Folks, uh, everyone satisfied? Grand. We'll be here tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern. Is that someone with a belated effort to speak up? Just nibbling turkey. Uh, we'll be here tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. The Wisdom of Psychopaths. I am so excited. Kevin Dunn, we're picking up on uh, Chapter 2. Chapter 2, Wisdom of Psychopaths. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, compensatory call is this Saturday, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, if you have commentary, gripes, uh, the art again, there have been uh, massive, massive interference with the archives. I wasn't even able to upload uh, yesterday's broadcast to iTunes. It is available on uh, iTunes. It's available on Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, you can download it there as well um, or stream it. You can listen to it online as well. Uh, but there has been uh, major problems with the archives. Uh, it is beyond my control. I strongly suspect it is racist interference, especially because it's been intermittent. At times it works. At other times it does not. But I'll see if I can upload uh, today's broadcast as well as yesterday's broadcast uh, as soon as possible. Hopefully it'll be working this evening. I will update as I find out additional information uh, with that. Certainly because whites have said this is a holiday. I would encourage sobriety uh, this entire weekend all the way through Tuesday at least. Uh, they're probably going to have a substantial amount of checkpoints uh, and officers on the lookout over this weekend. It's a big travel weekend. They know a lot of people are out on the roads. You do not want to be caught behind the wheel, driver or passenger under the influence on this weekend. Uh, man, if you got to consume, I would encourage sobriety. If you got to consume anything, stay wherever you are. If you're at your house, you're staying crashing with the relatives or whatever you're doing. Stay there. You don't want to be out and about race soldiers. They are looking for black people to abuse and mistreat. You do not want to make it easier being under the influence when you are not thinking you're best capable of making the best decisions under conditions of war. Sobriety would be best. Dr. Welsing would encourage that. Mr. Fuller would encourage that. Dr. Cambon would encourage that. Minister Malcolm would encourage that. Dr. Marimba Ani, lots of the folks that we revere and say that we have some gratitude for the work that they've done. They would strongly encourage sobriety. Let's preserve our health, our mental well-being so that we can think and create concepts to solve this problem white supremacy racism. Uh, with that, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cal signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Uh, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>